Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Eyewitness Report Transcript Rustic Farms, New Hampshire Discovery Site Witness, Richard A. Fabian I'd always wanted to hike. Like, really hike. None of these trails or pathways. Those are too linear. When I was little, my dad took me through a forest, and it was the most exhilarating hike I'd ever been on. The animals we saw, the plants, the views, they remained unmatched in my mind for far too long. I finally had a chance to take my son off trail yesterday morning. I told my wife we were going to stay on the clearest path, but after we parked and I saw the woods, thoughts of that hike with my father came flooding back. I changed my mind quickly after that. The woods before us were thick, lush, breathtaking. This was my chance to take my son on the adventure of a lifetime, the same way my father took me. Had I known what we would eventually see, maybe I would have chosen to stay on the trails. No, I definitely would have. We were off the trail for a solid two or three hours. Brian was hanging in there. He may be young, but he was determined. I did ask him at one point if he'd rather go back to the trail, and he made me so proud by saying, you don't see the real wilderness from the trail, Dad. <laughs> it was something I'd told him before, and he remembered. We were both on the same page. The first thing I saw was the old mangled fence. It was rusted and mostly smashed down to the ground, embedded in some weeds and grass. We followed the fence to a metal stake that once held it upright. We came across at least three or four of those stakes before I saw the sign. Rustic Farms, Population 3622. It was an old sign. The corners were rusted and flaking off. The ink the words were printed with was mostly faded but still legible. There were two bullet holes through it as well. Target practice or missed shots at something else, that's up for debate. Curiosity got the best of me at that point. I'd never heard of rustic farms, and I'd been coming to this general area since I was very young. We pressed forward on my instructions. We came next to the first skull. It was a dog's skull, although I'm not sure of the breed. After seeing a couple more bones scattered about, Brian started to get nervous. He wanted to go back to the trail at that point, but selfishly I said the trail was too far to get back to now. I said I wanted to see if there was anything else left of whatever rustic farms once was. We continued through the woods for another 15 or 20 minutes before I saw the first house. It was old, decrepit, and hidden within the trees. The growth of nature around it served as an almost perfect camouflage. We approached the house. I would have placed it in maybe the colonial times, but I'm not sure. There was broken glass outside of the door, maybe from a jar or a bottle. The door had completely deteriorated, and the house seemed infested with bugs. Termites, probably, considering the heavy structural damage. I told Brian to stay outside while I took a quick look inside. I didn't plan on going too far into the house. I may be adventurous, but I know an unstable floor when I see one. The house seemed frozen in time almost from that colonial era. There were still candles on the tables, whittled cups, pots, and pans. I tripped over the bones. When I looked down, there was a human skeleton laying on its back looking up at me. Its mouth was agape, and the skeleton appeared to have fused with the floorboards over time. They had become one. I ran back out of the house and saw Brian a few yards away. 
I called for him, but he hurriedly waved me over to him. When I got beside him, he pointed at another hidden house, almost identical to the one I had just been in. I went out to this second house as well, where glass had also been shattered just outside the door. I peeked in, and even though it was dark inside, the sunlight was just enough for me to see more human skeletons. We left immediately after that. When we finally got back into town, I called the authorities. I told them what I saw and was asked to escort a small group of investigators to the location. It wasn't long before an entire army of investigators and crime scene technicians swarmed the scene. They uncovered a dozen more homes, shops, and horse stables within a few miles of where I took them. Rustic Farms appeared to have been a town that went extinct in modern times without anyone even knowing about it. I wish I knew why. All those people were dead, and no one knew anything about them. It was sad. Hopefully one day, the families of those Rustic Farms citizens will at least be made aware. It's scary not knowing what happened there. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up, it's Thriller Thursday when I bring you short horror stories of fiction. In this extra-long episode, My Father Punished Me When I Talked to Ghosts by Edwin Crow. In Our Town by Maddie Kate. The Sandwich by Jim Stein. We'll end with a story from Christopher Maxim called The Rental. But we begin with The Hool, or The Exanguination of Burroughs, Wisconsin. We'll also hear its prequel, The Milk Boy, both by Scott Donnelly. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, listen to my other podcasts like Retro Radio, Old Time Radio in the Dark, Church of the Undead, and a classic 1950s sci-fi style podcast called Auditory Anthology. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Three years later, it was a scorching summer. Even the playful music spinning from the ice cream truck wasn't enough to lure the children out of their homes. The pavement sizzled and the grass browned. The air was dry and the drought in southern Wisconsin had finally taken its toll on the community. At the age of 30, Felix Ryder had found himself living back at his parents' house in Burroughs, Wisconsin, a quiet farming community located 50 miles west of Madison. He sat at the kitchen table with the job listings open in front of him. He knew he'd probably have better luck searching online, but it didn't hurt to look everywhere. A diamond in the rough was exactly what he was after. Grace, his mother, hobbled into the kitchen with the help of a wooden cane. She stopped and watched her son finger through the pages. It wasn't his fault the company he worked for went under, but it was definitely time to start looking hard again for work. His beard and hair were starting to remind her of a wild animal. "'Any luck?' she asked. Felix was unaware his mother was there. He fixed his glasses. "'I just started looking again.' He took a sip of his water and gently sat it back down on the table. His mother joined him at the table. She was there for support, as a mother should be. But to Felix, she was lingering. Too close. At 30 years old, the last thing he expected to be doing was living in his parents' basement. No job, no girlfriend, nowhere to live. 
This was not the life he'd been hoping for. Now he was home again, silently putting up with his mother's lingering and his father's obsessive collecting, which one could argue bordered on hoarding. The garage was filled with, for lack of a better term, crap, as was the attic, and if the basement didn't need to be cleared out for his arrival three weeks ago, Felix was sure the basement would have been quite the disastrous sight as well. Felix looked up at his mother, who smiled at him. You sleep okay, Mom? No, I don't remember the last time I had a good night's sleep. Definitely before you were born, she joked. Felix gave her a pity laugh, but he wasn't really in the mood for jokes. How about you? Is the basement comfortable enough? Felix nodded. I'm hoping not to be in your hair for much longer. You're not in our hair, Grace smiled, resting her wrinkled hand on Felix's. It's nice to have you home again. We don't see nearly enough of you anymore. You have your own life in the big city. He politely pulled his hand away from under his mother's and used it to grab his cup of water. He took another forced sip and then sat it back down in the same wet ring he'd picked it up from. The days seemed to drag. There wasn't enough to do around Burroughs, and the extreme heat made it difficult to even get out of the house. But Felix forced himself to. He'd rather suffer through the heat than be confined to the house where his parents were. They weren't bad people, but he had already done his time. As it was, he didn't even make them empty nesters until he was in his early twenties. A delay in ambition on his part was to blame. But when he finally broke free, he never planned to come back. Life blindsided him. Felix walked through the old town of Burroughs. It was quite small, but appropriate for the size of the population. It was a farming town, and exported corn and wheat almost daily during the prime seasons. Burroughs was widely known for the Mason Dairy Farm, the town's flagship industry. But with the drought, most of the crops had died, and the farmers couldn't do much until a heavy rain would fall. That left the cows on the dairy farm struggling to eat appropriately, which severely hindered the milk supply. Aside from a couple of cars that passed by him, he didn't see any other people out and about. Felix walked to the corner where an ice cream shop sat. There was a help wanted sign in the window, but he wasn't that desperate. Yet. He looked through the pane glass window and saw the old man inside smiling and waving him in. Ah, what the hell, Felix thought. He walked into the shop and the bells chimed. It was much cooler inside which was a relief, but he wasn't much of an ice cream guy. "'You're my first customer today,' the old man smiled. "'And you lured me in,' Felix laughed. "'Buy a scoop, and I'll slap another one on for free!' Felix stood at the counter and looked at the dozen or more flavors beneath the glass. It was colorful, but still not incredibly appealing. Felix was more of a chips and salsa guy than one for sweets, he kept it as simple as possible. Vanilla, please. You got it. The old man happily prepared the waffle cone with two scoops, just as he promised. He even added sprinkles and whipped cream and topped it off with a dripping cherry from a plastic jar. Felix finished the cone in minutes after leaving the shop. He used the napkin the old man supplied to wipe the drips off of his hand and disposed of it in a public trash can at the corner. He looked around contemplating his next move, but he couldn't think of one. Boredom was a huge factor in him leaving Burroughs to begin with. It was all coming back to him now. He walked back to his family's farm, only about a quarter of a mile from downtown Burroughs, and saw a mail truck parked in front. The mail carrier, a middle-aged woman wearing the standard blue cotton uniform, stood at the front door, holding a dark box and a stack of mail that was rubber-banded together. It looked like she'd been standing there for some time, but neither of his parents were answering the door. Felix picked up his pace in an attempt to keep the woman from waiting any longer than she had to. "'Hey there!' he called out. The mail carrier turned and looked. "'Sorry, it's my parents' house. Are they not answering?' "'No, I've waited longer than I probably should,' the woman said. "'This package needs a signature, though. I was hoping to catch them.' I'm Felix, their son. I can sign for it. 
The carrier handed Felix the scanner, and he signed his name. The device beeped after accepting the signature, and he handed it back to her. Thank you, she said with a warm smile. Have a nice day now. You as well. The mail carrier climbed back into her little box truck, started the engine, and drove off. Felix stood at the door with the dark box and letters in his grip. He sat the mail down on the kitchen table and pushed the letters aside. The package interested him more. It was wrapped in black paper that appeared to be folded and creased many times over. A white sticker had the package addressed to Francis Ryder, and the return address was from someone named Juniper Rose, definitely an eBay seller of some kind. Felix shook his head, wondering what kind of garbage his father had ordered this time. Speaking of which, where are they? He walked to the living room but didn't see anyone. He then went to the bottom of the stairs. Mom? Dad? There was no answer from either of them. A loud thud then grabbed his attention and he rushed to the side window. He pulled the curtains back and saw his dad standing out at the barn, holding his arm which appeared to be red. Fearing the worst, Felix rushed outside. His dad was working in the barn trying to fix a gate when he sliced his forearm against an exposed nail. Felix hurried to grab the cleanest rag he could find and wrapped it around his dad's arm. Are you okay? What happened? His dad laughed. Just clumsy these days. Felix looked into the barn at the wooded gate his father had been working on. It wasn't as pristine as his past work. It was crooked, and the nails were bent, so they didn't go all the way in. Felix looked back at his father. He was older, definitely not the man he used to be. But age was the culprit here. He'd been losing his hair for quite some time, something that Felix feared for himself as well as each year ticked by, and was slow to get around. His eyes looked permanently tired, and he had a slight shake in his hands that made Felix a little nervous. Let's get you inside, Dad. I'll help you clean this up. Felix helped his father through the yard and into the house. At the kitchen sink, where the wound was tended to, Felix wrapped his dad's arm in a bandage that he found under the sink. He dried off the area around the bandage one more time and helped his dad sit down in a chair at the table. Where's mom? I think her Rosemary picked her up for lunch. Felix nodded. Rosemary had been his mother's best friend since the 70s. At least he knew she was in good hands. Francis finally noticed the box on the table, wrapped in the black crinkly paper. What's this? Came in the mail. Looks like an eBay order. Francis pulled the package closer and saw it was from Juniper Rose. He smiled. It is. It's a collection from the Rustic Farms Discovery. Felix looked confused. What's that? His dad's eyes lit up. It was a fantastic find a few years back. Historic, really. I'm surprised you haven't heard of it. Francis tore through the black paper to reveal a sealed cardboard box. As he opened the box, he explained, A few years ago, a father and son were hiking deep in a New England forest. They came across the remains of an old town completely unknown to anybody. It was overgrown and infested with bugs and animals. It's like the town had gone completely extinct. Rustic Farms? That was the town name? Yep. They found a sign. They found homes and bones, but no explanation. They dated the town back to the 1800s. Francis opened the box to reveal a small grouping of individually sealed items. Felix looked in with curiosity. They didn't know what to do with the recovered items from the town, anything that wasn't interesting or important, that is. They auctioned them all off, and now this guy, Juniper Rose, sells grab bag groupings of the items basically keepsakes for anyone to claim they own mysterious pieces of history. Francis pulled out the first sealed item. It was a candle, half melted, wrapped in a golden twine. Francis smiled at it and then set it aside before pulling out a wooden spoon. The spoon was bent very unnaturally, possibly due to aging and deterioration. He set it aside as well and then pulled out what appeared to be a baseball-sized marble. It swirled with many colors, most of them darker, and seemed to rattle like it held smaller marbles or other items inside of it. 
Francis sat it down and reached in for the last item. Felix picked up the sealed marble and looked at it carefully. Dad, how much did you spend on this crap? It's not crap. It's part of an unknown place in North American history. This stuff will be very sought after one day, and we'll own it. Although Felix didn't agree with the desperate purchase, it wasn't his money. He looked the marble all over, gently shaking it to hear the things inside. He noticed the exterior of the marble was fully intact. How did they seal this? I don't see where it was put together. I don't know, Francis said, not even paying attention. He was too busy looking at the last item, a rusted pair of scissors that seemed cracked or broken in numerous spots. Felix shook his head and sat the marble back down. Francis was more than pleased with his package. He put everything back in the box and folded the top back over. I'll probably order more of these. <laughs> I'm sure you will. As the evening settled over Burroughs, Grace came home and prepared chicken stew for dinner. The three of them ate the stew and homemade bread, and each retired to their rooms for the night. When Felix walked down the creaking steps to his basement room, he saw the box of Rustic Farms items. It had begun. His face was being taken over by his father's compulsive hoarding. I wonder when he'll ever look into this box again, Felix thought. He picked up the box and moved it to the back room where the water heater was. He sat it on the floor, closed the door, and plopped down on his bed. The days were blending together. Tomorrow would be another day to look for a job. Tomorrow would be another day with the hopes of leaving his parents' house once again. He closed his eyes as darkness fell over Burroughs. Felix was awoken suddenly to the sound of his mother screaming and stumbling across the floor above him, ending with a loud thud. He ripped the covers off and flew up the stairs to his mother's aid. The first thing he saw was blood on the floor and stained on the carpet. He saw his mother on the floor propped up against the wall near the television. Her cane was a few feet away, and he saw the blood coming from her feet. He quickly was able to follow the bloody footprints back to the open front door. He rushed to her side and helped her into the closest chair. Are you okay? Grace was crying. It hurts. He looked at the bottom of her feet where small shards of glass were stuck right into the skin. He didn't understand. What happened? He looked back at the front door, catching a glimpse of the shimmering broken glass on the doormat outside. It... I didn't even see it there, Grace said of the broken glass. It must have fallen out of the trash can when your father took it out yesterday. That was in the afternoon, Felix said. Was it there when you came home last night? I don't think so, she winced, as the blood continued to steadily trickle out of the bottoms of her feet. I need to take you to the doctor. Felix stood up and went to the front door. The glass looked like the remnants of a bottle. The bottom part of it was still mostly intact, but the top part was shattered and speckled with Grace's blood. An odor entered Felix's nostrils, a sour, rotten scent. He cringed at the overwhelming stench and then quickly brushed it aside in order to help his mother. Dr. Hummel, a local family doctor so close to retirement, extracted the glass from Grace's feet, stitched them up where necessary, and bandaged them up. He supplied her with a wheelchair to borrow and suggested that she stay off her feet for a few days until the tenderness went away. "'I'll write a prescription to the pharmacy for some painkillers, Grace,' Dr. Hummel said. "'Those should do wonders for you.' "'Thank you, Dr. Hummel,' Grace said with an appreciative smile. He nodded and scribbled on a prescription pad. He sloppily signed his name and handed Felix a slip. "'Pamper your mother, Felix,' Hummel said. I want her on the couch or bed with a good TV movie and some soup. Rest is the best medicine." Felix nodded with a smile. He folded the slip and stuffed it in his pocket. Thank you. Felix wheeled Grace to the car, where Francis kept the air conditioning running. Felix struggled to help his mother into the passenger seat but eventually succeeded without the help of his father. Francis remained in the driver's seat, listening to the weather report on the radio. Felix folded up the wheelchair, popped it in the trunk, and climbed into the back seat. "'No end in sight, Felix,' Francis said. "'What do you mean?' 
a drought. Weatherman says at least another five days of heat. We're all doomed to die this summer. Francis laughed. Mom's going to be okay, Felix said, annoyed that his father didn't even ask or acknowledge her being back in the car. Rest in painkillers. Francis looked to his wife with a smile. Good to hear, honey. She smiled back, almost like she expected that kind of a response from him. As Francis shifted the car into drive and pulled away from the curb, Felix looked out the window as a young man was helping his wife out of the passenger seat of another car. Her feet appeared to have been covered in blood as well. Strange, Felix thought. Grace was set up on the couch in front of a Lifetime original movie and leftover chicken stew. Do you need anything else right now, Mom? She smiled. I should be okay. I have the bell. She playfully shook the small bell on the table next to her. I'll be in as soon as you ring it. She sat the bell back down and Felix left the room. He went to the kitchen where he poured himself a glass of fresh lemonade and drank it at the window. He watched as his father walked into the barn with a shovel. Curious, he thought. Felix walked into the barn and saw his father sitting on a bale of hay with the dirty shovel in his hand. He looked tired or confused. Dad, are you okay? Francis looked up. His eyes were bloodshot and his pupils were large. Concerned, Felix rushed to his father's side. What's wrong? Just a little tired, his father said. Farm life has taken its toll on this old man. What were you doing? Francis looked around and drew a blank. He looked at the shovel and saw dirt caked onto the chipped spade, but couldn't for the life of him remember why he had it. His father's silence said everything. Felix feared this day, the day his parents would eventually go downhill. Their health was not what it used to be, and it was becoming clear that they wouldn't be able to live on their own much longer. A cool breeze blew through the open barn door and brought momentary relief from the extreme heat. But it also carried the same sour odor Felix had smelled that morning. What's that smell, Dad? Francis sniffed the air and made a strange face. It's terrible, like sour milk or something. Smells like something's dead out there. Have you killed any animals on the farm in the past few days? Francis shook his head. I don't think so. Felix walked to the barn door and looked around the farm. Nothing stood out to him as abnormal. The trees blew gently and the weather vane gently swayed on the roof of the house. If burrows couldn't have cooler temperatures or even just rain, a breeze here and there was more than welcome. If only that stench didn't have to accompany it. They're not in good shape, Felix said over the phone. I'm starting to think I'm going to be here longer than I wanted to be. Well, the city misses you, Flex, the man on the other line said. He was Eric Humphrey, Felix's best friend from Green Bay, where he'd traveled from after losing his job. Packers are starting the preseason in two weeks. Anyway, you'll be back for the first game? Felix sighed. Doubt it. I'll probably just have to watch the grainy video from here. The reception out here is terrible, Eric. Burroughs is from another time. I wish I was there with you, Eric said, and then laughed. <laughs> Very funny. Felix looked around the basement, which was only half finished. It was cooler down there than the rest of the house, but musty. A small box TV sat on top of two old milk crates that were stacked on top of one another. The exposed light bulb hanging from the ceiling was starting to lose its brightness, and the walls had random cracks here and there. The bed was the only thing even remotely comfortable about the room. I have to get out of here, man. Pudgies has hired a full-time bartender. Eric said. Pudgies? <laughs> like the bar we frequent for games? Just a suggestion, man. You get killer tips, especially on ladies' night. Drunk girls tossing money around to the handsome bartender? You'd clean up. Felix confidently shook his head. No, I'm not going from a money bags position at Tech Corp to passing drinks down a dirty bar to drunks who don't even know exactly how drunk they are. Eric sighed on the other line. 
Eh, you're too picky, Flex. Lower your standards, pal. I'll find a job on my own, Eric. Thank you. Felix snapped. An uncomfortable silence flooded the phone. I have to go, Felix said, and hung up before Eric could even say goodbye. He slapped his phone down on the bed and stared up at the light bulb, which seemed to be dimming quickly. A quick flash inside the bulb blew it out, and the room fell into darkness. He then heard the bell from his mother upstairs. Felix closed his eyes and took a deep breath. This is my life now, he thought. The bell rang again. Coming! Felix walked through the living room where the room was darker than he thought it would be for only being the late afternoon. He noticed all the lights were out. He noticed the silence. Mom? The TV went out, Felix, she groggily said from the chair. He walked to the TV and saw that it was still plugged in. Uh, power must be out. The light downstairs blew, too. Felix walked to the window, where he saw dark clouds slowly crawling across the sky in the distance. <sighs> the weatherman was wrong. What? Grace asked. The weatherman, on the radio? He said the drought would continue. I see dark clouds coming. It might rain, maybe even a storm. Grace didn't respond. Felix turned around. Mom? He said. He walked closer and saw her face. She looked sick. She was as pale as a ghost, and beads of sweat had formed on her forehead. Mom? He looked to her feet and saw blood had saturated through the bandages. Felix quickly grabbed a blanket off the back of the couch and wrapped it around her feet. All right, he said, trying to remain calm. I, I think the cuts are infected. I'm going to call Dr. Hummel. Mom? He moved her head around, but she wasn't responding. Mom! He tried again, more frantically. Dad! He called out loudly. Francis emerged from the kitchen, seemingly disoriented. Everything okay? He slurred. Dad? Francis stumbled into the living room and collapsed into the coffee table, breaking it in half and crumbling to the floor. Dad! Felix sat his father up and tried to snap him back into consciousness, but it was no use. Francis passed out, and Felix gently laid him back onto the floor. He rushed back to Grace and she had also completely passed out. The blood was soaking through the blanket and pooling on the floor beneath her. Felix dialed 911 on his phone. When the paramedics arrived, they told Felix to wait outside. An old pickup truck pulled up in front of the house, and the small-town doctor, Hummel, climbed out, rushing up to the porch. "'What happened?' Hummel asked. "'I think my mom had an infection. She started bleeding everywhere and passed out.' Something was wrong with my dad, too. He passed out also. Had he been hurt? No, wait. He did cut himself on a nail yesterday, but it wasn't very deep, and come to think of it, he seemed disoriented earlier today, too. Like he forgot where he was and what he was doing. Huh, Dr. Hummel mumbled. He looked into the house to see if the paramedics had assessed the couple yet. Dr. Hummel, did you have another patient after us with cuts to their feet, too? That's confidential information, Dr. Hummel said. His look then told Felix everything he needed to know. He put two and two together and found the similar injuries odd. Was it glass on a porch by chance? Hummel looked right into Felix's eyes. It was a strange revelation. One of the paramedics emerged from the house and put his hand on Felix's shoulder. He looked deeply bothered. Are they okay? Felix asked. They didn't make it, Mr. Ryder, the paramedic said. Felix didn't understand. What? They... they're... They've passed on. Felix was overcome by a million thoughts. He started to tremble and dropped to his knees. Both of them? He softly mouthed to himself. A distant rumble of thunder brought his attention back to the dark clouds in the distance. The paramedic looked up and saw dull flashes of lightning within the clouds. We need to get them out of here, the paramedic said. I can call the coroner for you, Hummel said, remaining sympathetic. Felix remained on his knees, unable to focus his emotions on just one. The clouds inched closer to Burroughs, making the sky darker and darker by the minute. Two hours had passed since his parents were both pronounced dead, and Felix remained in the house, 
gathering cleaning chemicals to get the blood out of the carpet. It seemed sick that he was responsible for this part of it, but Burroughs wasn't a big city like Green Bay. They didn't have the forensic resources. A soft beep echoed through the quiet house, and Felix recognized it immediately. It was his phone losing battery power. He grabbed it off the counter and plugged it into the wall to charge, but it didn't connect. The power was still out. He tore it out of the wall and collapsed to the ground, scooting back against the wall and finally broke down. Felix cried and sulked. His stomach hurt from the crying and the pain of the unexpected events of the day. His parents were gone. What were the chances of both of them passing at the same time? It doesn't make sense, he thought. A rumble of thunder in the distance lightly shook the house. The dishes in the kitchen cabinet rattled, and Felix looked to the window. It was becoming darker. He stood up and made his way to the front door. He opened it, quickly looking at the welcome mat where the glass had been, and then looked across his parents' land, at the black clouds maliciously lurking in the sky. The dead cornfield swayed gently in the breeze, and the homemade wind chimes jingled on the porch. The old wooden windmill out in the field started to spin and then turn. It faced the farmhouse, and then the blades picked up speed. A familiar sour stench crawled across the farm and hit Felix's senses with an unforgiving punch. He covered his mouth and nose and rushed back into the house. He closed the door and locked it. He became overwhelmed with a feeling of dread like something bad was about to happen. The clouds outside were as black as night, and the odor that filled the farm was nauseating. Felix could hear the wind chimes clashing back and forth, back and forth, and then a snap sent them crashing to the wooden planks of the porch. An emergency alert sent his cell phone dancing across the floor with the sudden sporadic vibrations. He grabbed the phone from the ground and looked at the red alert screen. This is an alert from the National the screen glitched and went black before he could read the test. A loud, earth-shaking clap of thunder sent Felix's heart almost to his chest. He jumped and frantically looked around. He rushed to the window and saw the entire sky had become black, overtaken by the strange clouds. His heartbeat picked up. Felix could hear it in his ears. Thump, thump, thump. His jaw trembled and he became scared, frightened. He'd never been afraid of storms before. Why was this one any different? Felix dashed for the basement door and shuffled rapidly down the stairs and into the darkness below the house. He climbed into bed and threw the blankets over his head, shivering in fear beneath them. It was what a child would do, not a grown man in the real world. But this didn't feel like the real world. Felix was overcome with a surreal sensation. He'd become dizzy. His vision was spinning, dipping in and out of blurriness. He closed his eyes and felt like he was falling. Help! He tried to call out, but not even he could hear his own voice screaming. A searing pain then sliced through his head, snapped a nerve, and everything went silent. We'll return to Scott Donnelly's The Hool when Weird Darkness returns. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. It was an unbalanced shuffling noise across the floor that woke him. 
It bothered him because there was supposed to be no one else in the house. Felix awoke but didn't open his eyes just yet. They were still heavy and he felt nauseous. He was hot, breathing in and out under the heavy blankets for what felt like hours. It smelled musty, like sweat. The shuffling noise seemed to pass by him as he continued to lay under the sheets on his bed. Whatever it was, was slow moving, which stood out even more because of the overwhelming silence that surrounded him. He didn't even hear the thunder anymore. He did hear a beep, though, from his phone upstairs. It hadn't completely died yet. Felix thought about his parents. Were they still dead? Or was this just one terrible dream that he was finally waking up from? It all could have been passed off as a dream. His current life state, his parents' sudden passing, scary as hell storm that came out of nowhere. Whatever was shuffling across the floor bumped into something and it rattled. Maybe the TV on the milk crates? Felix knew he was awake now, so that noise was not a dream. It was real, and something was in the basement with him. He tried to lift his arm to pull the sheets back, but they too were heavy, like bags of wet sand. He could barely move a muscle. They were locked up on him. He then heard the door to the back room creak open, painfully slow. Was it someone who came to check on him after the storm? An intruder? An animal? Hello? Felix tried to call out, but no words were vocalized. His body was shut down. He couldn't move or speak, but it wasn't on his own. Something was keeping him from communicating. If it was something there to help, they were looking in the wrong place. There was nothing in that back room except junk his father had collected over the years. Help! Felix tried to say again, but barely had the strength to even open his mouth. He began to feel tired again. The stress of the situation brought on a strong fatigue. His vision blurred again and his mind began to spin. Felix passed out again. Felix? Are you home? A man's voice called. In his dream state, Felix thought it was the voice of his father, but after it woke him up, he heard it again. Felix? And he knew it wasn't his father's voice. Felix sat up in his bed and the sheets fell off of him. They were soaked with sweat and he felt clammy himself. He looked around the basement where sunlight was hazily coming through a small window high on the wall. It was morning. The storm, or whatever it was, was over. The nauseous feeling he'd felt all night was also gone, and now he was just hungry. He looked across the basement and saw the back room door was wide open, and then he remembered the shuffling noise. Felix climbed out of bed and walked over to the back room, peeking in. It was dark and quiet. He reached for the light switch just inside the door and flipped it. Nothing. He flipped it back and forth multiple times with the same results. The power was still out. Felix, are you here? He heard the man's voice again this time along with the floor creaking above him. He recognized the voice now. It was Dr. Hummel's voice. Felix rushed upstairs and saw Dr. Hummel standing in the living room next to the couch where his mother had died a day earlier. Felix was still trying to shake off the confusion from the night. "'What are you doing here?' Felix asked. Dr. Hummel stepped closer to Felix, looking him up and down with obvious concern. You look terrible. Are you sick? Sit down, Felix. The friendly doctor helped Felix sit down on the couch and then started to visually examine him. You look like hell, kid, he said. Rough night, I guess. Let me get you some water. Dr. Hummel went to the kitchen and grabbed a glass from the cabinet. He filled it halfway with water from the tap and brought it back to Felix. Felix took a sip and didn't even realize how dry his mouth was until the water touched it. It was refreshing, and even though it was a small amount, it was rejuvenating. Are you okay? Dr. Hummel asked again. Felix nodded. I was worried about you after yesterday, Hummel said. 
power is out all over town and you weren't answering your cell phone. I wanted to make sure you were okay. Felix looked to the floor where his phone was. It was close enough that he was able to lean down and pick it up. He tapped the screen a couple of times and pressed the buttons on the side. It had finally died. What kind of storm was that last night? Felix asked. I think I passed out. Not sure, actually. I've never seen anything like it. It was dark as hell, though. There was loud thunder, some strong winds, but that was it. No rain? Hummel chuckled. <laughs> we didn't get that lucky. Felix took another sip of water. Was there anyone else here with you last night? No. Why? The front door was wide open when I got here a bit ago, and that was sitting out there on your welcome mat. Hummel pointed to a small table by the front door. There was a small glass bottle. Felix gawked at it and stood up. He slowly approached it and picked it up. It was a milk bottle, a couple centuries old if he had to guess. There was a dried white substance around the interior ring at the bottom of it. He put the open bottle to his nose and sniffed. His senses were immediately struck by a foul stench, and he viciously turned his head away from it. It was unmistakably sour milk, very reminiscent of the odor he'd smelled around the farm, only stronger because of its contained quarters within the bottle. Disgusted, he put it back on the table and turned to the doctor. It was just sitting out there? Yes. My mom stepped on glass yesterday. She probably stepped on a bottle and shattered it. That's what cut her. Hummel finally caved. There were multiple cases yesterday of people stepping on glass. They sound clumsy or oblivious, but there is no door-to-door milk delivery these days. No one would expect that. But who's leaving old milk bottles on porches? Dr. Hummel was just as stumped as Felix. Have you checked on those other patients since you saw them? No, I haven't been into the office yet. Felix was overcome again with worry and dread. It rushed over him like an ocean, and in the pit of his stomach, he felt those other patients needed to be checked on right away. Let's go to your office. Hummel was confused. Why? I want you to check on the other patients. Make sure they didn't get the infection like my mom did. Hummel nodded. Felix's concern started to bleed into his own mind, and now he needed to know as well. He stood up from the couch and pulled his keys from his pocket. Traffic was congested throughout Burroughs. Street lights were out, and everyone was left to create their own order while driving through town. Hummel drove his truck through Burroughs and parked alongside the road just outside of his small corner office. Hummel and Felix hopped out of the truck and walked briskly to the front of the office, which had been repurposed from a house at one point. The shutters on the windows and the porch swing by the door made it more of a cozy experience. They walked through the front door, and a young female receptionist greeted the two men with a friendly smile. Good morning, Dr. Hummel, she said, eyeing Felix next. Good morning, Sarah. Anyone come in yet? Sarah shook her head. No, the phones and computers are down. Everything's down. It's kind of crazy. She laughed. Were there any messages from last night, before the power went out? I don't know. If there was, I wouldn't be able to access them now. Who were the other two patients with the gashes on their feet yesterday? Sarah looked at Felix. She remembered him now. He brought his mother in for a similar injury. Um, Sarah sifted through a stack of files on her desk. She found one almost immediately and found the second one near the bottom of the stack. She handed the files to Hummel. These were the other two aside from Grace Ryder. Hummel read the names on the front of the file. Gary Luther and Regina Kelly. He looked at Felix and said, come on. With the two files in hand, Hummel walked back out of the office with Felix following him like a puppy. They drove across town to Gary Luther's farm. He was a lone weed farmer who coincidentally had a field which backed up to the rider's farm. Dr. Hummel parked his truck next to a larger truck, and the two men climbed out. The farm was quiet. There didn't seem to be any wind coming across the land, so the windmill stood still, and the wind chimes on either side of the covered porch appeared frozen in time. A few chickens clucked from the hen house around the side of Gary's home, and Felix noticed horses grazing in the mostly dead field of wheat. The front door to the house was open, so Dr. Hummel and Felix ascended the porch steps cautiously. 
At the doorway, they were yet with yet another disgusting odor. This one was more decay and less sour. Hummel knew the odor immediately, and his professional experience told him what he would be walking in on. Stay here, the doctor said. But what is, please, Felix, stay here. Hummel was pleading, so Felix reluctantly obliged and backed up. He watched as the doctor slowly crept into the house, carefully watching his footing, and disappeared around the corner. Felix stood back and glanced out amongst the land. The farm was set up similar to his family's but was by far larger. The wheat fields stretched way off into the horizon and became one with the sky. Gary Luther even had scarecrows perched every couple of acres or so, something his parents never bothered to do. His mom never liked the looks of them. They're too scary, she would say, but wasn't that the point? Dr. Hummel came back out from inside the house. He held a handkerchief over his mouth and nose. Felix knew what the damage was, but Dr. Hummel confirmed it. He's dead on the floor. Felix poked his head in the door anyway and saw Gary Luther, a middle-aged lifetime farmer, dead on the floor. Blood was pooled beneath his feet and his body had succumbed to rigor mortis. He lay on his back with his hands sticking up like bent claws. His eyes were closed, his mouth was closed, and flies buzzed around the corpse. Felix fled back down the porch. We need to tell the police. We need to check Regina Kelly, Dr. Hummel firmly stated. He wanted all the facts before the local law enforcement began investigating. The drive to Regina's house was eerily quick. Out of Gary Luther's driveway, a sharp left turn and a quarter of a mile south took them right to the Cali household. It was at the edge of a small housing development known as Feather Falls. The mailbox with the flag still up and Cali printed on the side told them they were in the right place. Dr. Hummel parked along the curb and right away they saw a man standing in the front yard, watering a potted plant by the front steps. As Felix and the doctor approached the man, he recognized Hummel. Dr. Hummel, the man asked, concerned by his seemingly random appearance. Hummel extended his hand and shook the young man's. Timothy Kelly, correct? Timothy nodded. How's your wife? She's resting, Timothy said. He set the watering can down on the porch and then curiously looked at Felix and then the doctor again. Do you normally do unannounced follow-ups at your patients' homes? No, I just have specific concerns about Regina's health. Has she shown any signs of infection, or has she started bleeding again? Timothy shook his head. Not that I'm aware of. She wanted to rest, you know, take a little nap, so I came out here and started doing some yard work since that storm last night failed to give us any rain. May I see her, Timothy? Timothy grew uneasy. He was worried about the attention Dr. Hummel was putting on his wife. She was fine ten minutes ago, Doc. If anything changes, I'll call you. Power's out all over town, Felix added. Timothy faced him next. And what business do you have seeing my wife? Felix didn't respond. Timothy turned back to the doctor one last time. I'll call you if we need you, Dr. Hummel. I appreciate your concern. Have a good day. Mr. Callie shot Felix an evil eye and then picked up the watering can again. He went about his yard work, and Dr. Hummel climbed back into the truck with his passenger. What now? Felix asked. Hummel took a deep breath. I don't know. Something does seem off, though. Something's wrong here in Burroughs. Felix looked out the window and watched as Timothy watered the plants. A woman next door exited her house with a dog on a leash and began to speed walk down the sidewalk. A flock of birds flew overhead as they cleared the large Feather Falls sign. Felix noticed the dark clouds again, creeping just over the horizon. Look, he said. Hummel leaned forward and looked out the passenger window. He saw the clouds, too. They were pitch black, not like normal storm clouds. I have to go to the police department to inform them about Gary Luther, Hummel said. I'll drop you back off at your house first. Okay, Felix said sat back in his seat, and Hummel pulled away from the curb.
Dr. Hummel dropped Felix off by his front porch and then drove away. Felix watched as the rocks and dirt were kicked up by the bald tires on the old truck, leaving a dusty trail in his wake as he disappeared around the bend. The dark clouds approached quicker this time, bringing the expected sudden gusts of wind. The windmill swayed out in the field and the porch swing started to rock back and forth, its metal hinges creaking loudly and in desperate need of WD-40. Felix went inside and closed the door. Habit told him to flip the light switch, but when the lights didn't come on, he remembered. Why is the power even out, he thought. There was no lightning last night. There was certainly a curious string of events taking place, but they were all so hard to make sense of, hard to even believe. The blood stain on the carpet made it all feel real, though. His mother's blood. It had poured from the gashes in her feet. Gashes brought on by the shattered glass of a centuries-old milk bottle randomly placed at their doorstep. Felix thought for a moment. Who would have access to those bottles? There was only one dairy farm in town, and it was run by Stitch Mason and his boys. If anyone would have access to vintage milk bottles like the ones showing up around town, it'd be them for sure. A rumble of thunder shook the house. Felix looked out the window. The sky was pitch black again. Felix studied the clouds more closely this time. They were long and wispy. Thousands of wispy strands made up the darkness above. They moved in so fast, commanding with the thunder that boomed from them. But aside from the wind, they didn't do anything else. No lightning, no funnel clouds, no precipitation, nothing. What was the purpose of them, and where did they come from? They most certainly weren't a normal act of nature. The clouds encapsulated the entire sky, at least as far as Felix could see. The darkness outside heavily shadowed the interior of the Ryder home, and then, just like that, the wind stopped. The port swing stopped creaking. The wind chimes fell silent. Felix was left in the dark house with the overwhelming quiet. He could hear his heartbeat throbbing in his ears again, and it was picking up as seconds crawled by. He started to feel the fear and dread again. The feeling was becoming too familiar and made Felix uncomfortable. As the dread built up inside him, threatening to blow at any moment, that's when the silence was broken. From outside, a distant cry emerged, like a soft extended howl from a wolf. But only it wasn't a wolf. It was distorted into an unnatural pitch and tone. It was animal-like, but Felix couldn't completely convince himself it was coming from an animal. Felix slowly approached the side window and looked out in the night-like darkness. Only subtle outlines of things could be seen. The edge of the barn, a slight reflection of the windmill blades from who knew where. As his eyes adjusted, he focused on the cornfield. It was as still as a painting. He could make out the outline of the corn stalks as well as the tractor sitting at the edge of the field. Then some of the stalks moved. They crinkled and crunched and sounded like they were right next to him. He watched from the house as a small section of the stalks at the edge began to bend forward, out from the rest of the field. The strange noise was back. It expressed itself like a high-pitched wind howling through something hollow. The sound sent chills throughout Felix's body, making it feel like he was standing naked in below-freezing temperatures. His nerves teetered on the edge, but he couldn't remove his eyes from the contorting corn stalks. The whool sound grew louder as the stalks continued to bend and crack and finally snap. Long, dark appendages began to emerge from behind the bending crops, slithering out like snakes or tentacles and waving in slow motion. Felix shot back away from the window and put his back against the wall. The whool sounded off again, even louder this time, shattering his nerves completely. What the hell is that? Felix's thoughts were a knot of frantic versions of the same question. It wasn't normal. None of this was. He crouched down between the couch and the wall and tried to remain hidden in the shadows from whatever was creeping out of the cornfield. The whool seemed to fade out to silence again. Not even the crickets were chirping. 
Felix remained hidden. Just because he couldn't hear it anymore didn't mean it wasn't still out there. The minutes began to go by, slowly at first and then a little quicker. A cautious sense of relief fell over him, but he was still too nervous to stand from his spot. There was a thud on the front porch followed by a dragging sound, and then it stopped. Felix tightened back up, trying to prepare for a sudden escape if the need were to arrive. Another thud hit the wooden floor of the porch outside and was once again followed up by a dragging sound. Thud. Drag. Thud. Drag. Felix could tell it was moving across the porch and getting closer to the front door. He'd forgotten to lock it. Felix's muscles tensed up as he thought briefly about sneaking over to lock it, but then stopped. He wasn't sure it was worth the risk. Thud. Drag. It was now directly outside of the front door. It wasn't moving, but he could hear the floorboards creaking beneath its weight as it just stood there. Does it know I'm here? Felix thought as his heart raced. The hool erupted again, startling Felix to his feet. It was louder and bolder than before. It was much more menacing. Felix looked to his left and saw the door to the basement was open. He risked it and ran for the doorway. He clambered down the basement stairs and into the room. The first thing he noticed was the confusing glow in the room. It was a dull yellow, but he couldn't see where it was even coming from. Everything was hazy, but he could see well enough. The second thing he noticed was even more confusing. Standing by the foot of his twin bed was a boy. He wore a tattered, cream-colored shirt with brown overalls pulled up over it. His shoes were dirty with caked-on mud, and his hair was greasy. He didn't appear well-kept. "'Where is it, mister?' the boy politely asked. Felix was in total shock. He didn't know this boy or have any idea what he was referring to. "'Where is it?' the boy softly repeated it. His voice was hollow and didn't have any emotion behind it. Felix slowly shook his head, not even believing his own eyes. "'How'd you get in here?' Felix nervously asked, his voice trapped in a trembling whisper. The boy smiled, but it wasn't genuine. His eyes appeared black. Francis let me in. Felix turned and saw his father standing at the bottom of the wooden stairs, gripping something in his hand. He was completely pale and looked all wrong. This wasn't his father. Don't tell it, Francis whispered without moving his mouth. Felix didn't understand. He snapped his head back to the boy who was gone and replaced by a hulking, smoky, distorted figure shrouded in black. Tell it. It angrily gurgled in a deep, hellish tone. Felix forced himself back into the wall and dashed up the basement stairs as fast as he could, scared to death that the creeping horror behind him was only inches from grabbing him by the ankles and pulling him back down into the dark abyss. He shook uncontrollably as he burst into the living room and sloppily stumbled across the room to the front door. He threw the door open and rushed outside where he was stopped by Dr. Hummel standing on the porch, facing him like a statue. He looked fake, like a wax figure of himself. Dr. Hummel? Felix stuttered. Dr. Hummel then fell forward, crashing face down on the porch and gushing a fountain of blood from a giant, gaping hole in his back. The blood sprayed up like a geyser and doused the porch as well as Felix. He screamed as the dark clouds above seemed to rapidly dissipate, bringing daylight back to Burroughs. The sudden change stopped him mid-scream, and he looked down as Hummel continued to spill blood all over the porch. Up next, we continue with The Hool by Scott Donnelly when Weird Darkness returns. The first letter seemed harmless enough, possibly even just the result of a mistaken delivery. The second one drew concern. 
and paired with the unexplained visions of something darkly unsettling, Sam Morris finally caves. The everyman safe world he lives in is about to take a drastic and dark turn. He quickly falls into a world of insanity, the morbid and the macabre. He's drawn into a darkness that is just as deadly as it is mysterious. A darkness that dwells in a house that could only be conjured up by a mad brain. It is a house that calls you, a house that haunts you with its ghosts. They'll scratch and claw through your fragile hide, bringing madness bubbling to the surface. Come see the ghosts for yourself, if you dare. Weird Darkness Publishing presents Of a Mad Brain by Scott Donnelly. Now available on paperback, ebook, and audiobook versions through Amazon and WeirdDarkness.com. Felix walked into town. He was covered from head to toe with the blood of Dr. Hummel, and he was lost in the mess of horrific images in his head, the ones he'd just witnessed at his family's farm. He saw his father. He saw the boy. He saw Dr. Hummel. But what he didn't see was the thing crawling out from the cornfield, the unknown presence at the farm that terrified him. The hool that echoed through the darkness was appalling it hit every nerve in his body. It was upsetting, uncomfortable, unnatural. As he walked through town in a confusing fog, that sound replayed over and over in his mind. It worried him, and he dreaded hearing it again. Felix shuffled up to the police department in the center of town. There was a small crowd of people standing outside. They seemed to be shouting at the building, trying to draw out the police. The scene didn't make sense to Felix as he wandered into the rowdy crowd. The dark blood staining his clothes, hair, and smearing his glasses drew frightened looks immediately. Some people screamed, some backed away fearfully, but one man put his arm around Felix and helped him sit down on the curb. "'Are you okay?' the man asked, genuinely concerned for Felix's well-being. The old man looked him up and down, trying to find a wound. Where are you hurt? I'm not, Felix said. This is Dr. Hummel's blood. Dr. Hummel? The man asked, putting up his guard. Felix looked at the old man in the eye. I didn't do anything to him. He came to my house. He, he was killed. The old man was trying to make sense of Felix's story. Felix then cocked his head at the old man. He recognized him from the ice cream shop. You gave me the free scoop. The old man nodded and then looked up at the police station. He charged up to the front doors with authority, banging on them with all the strength his old bones could muster. Open your doors! There's a man hurt out here, and Dr. Hummel is dead! The old man continued to bang on the doors loudly until they finally opened. The young officer in a blue uniform stood there with one hand on his holstered weapon. What'd you say? The officer inquired, making sure he heard the muffled shouting correctly. The old man pointed down to Felix, sitting on the curb, covered in blood. Son of a... The young officer rushed out to Felix's side. He helped him up and walked him into the police station. The old man winked and nodded to Felix as the doors closed once again. The police confiscated Felix's clothing, took his fingerprints, and read him his rights. He sat in a small, uncomfortable interrogation room, handcuffed and wearing a tan jumpsuit. His hair had been washed and his glasses sat on the table, neatly folded up in front of him. He watched the clock on the wall, but it failed to move. The batteries must have been dead or something. 12.01 was its permanent time now. Felix noticed the room was muggy. Either the air wasn't reaching the vents or they didn't have it turned on. That would have been surprising, though, considering the extreme heat as of late in the area. Felix cracked his neck and the pop sounded loud in the small room. The door then opened and a detective walked in. He dressed the part, but opted to not have a jacket on and had his sleeves rolled up. His bright gold watch sparkled under the lights above the table, as did the badge pinned on his belt. 
The detective removed a badge and sat it on the table. Felix looked at it. It was gold-plated, embedded in a torn brown leather casing. The detective cleared his throat and Felix looked up. He missed the part where the detective had sat down. "'I'm sorry?' Felix asked, feeling like he'd possibly missed something else. "'I said I'm Detective Chuck Barnes. I want to ask you a few things about the deceased.' Who? Dr. Hummel. Oh, okay. You have been read your rights, correct? Yes. Detective Barnes opened a small pad of paper and extracted a pen from his breast pocket. He clicked the pen and put the tip to the paper. A small spot of ink leaked from the tip and soaked into the paper. Do you know Dr. Hummel personally or professionally? I took my mom to see him. She'd cut her feet really bad when she stepped on the glass. And your mother died shortly after seeing Dr. Hummel. Yes. Malpractice. Is that what you thought? Felix was confused. I'm sorry, what? Do you think Dr. Hummel provided insufficient care to your mother, resulting in her death? Felix was stunned. He can't be serious, he thought. Are you accusing me of killing Dr. Hummel? Detective Barnes smiled and shrugged. You were mad. You were angry. You had the motive, and when Dr. Hummel showed up at your doorstep, you ripped into his back and spilt his blood everywhere. No, Felix said. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. I didn't do that. Where is it? Barnes grew more aggressive, and Felix shook his head rapidly. Tell it! Barnes slammed his fists down on the table, splashing Felix's face. He instinctively closed his eyes and felt the warm liquid hit his forehead and cheeks and drip down. He opened his eyes and looked at his hands, chest, and the table before him. They were all covered in blood. Felix looked up at Barnes, but there was no one sitting in front of him. The hool erupted once again, and Felix buried his head under his cuffed hands screaming back at the ungodly sound, fearfully challenging it. The inhuman cry built to an ear-shattering screech, and Felix felt his ears pop. Felix opened his eyes and was met by the blinding light from the sun. Everything was white and then started to come back into focus. He was sitting on his porch, propped up against the siding of the house. He was still covered in blood, and Dr. Hummel was still sprawled out, face first, on the porch in front of him. The gushing blood from his back had stopped, but his body, as well as the wooden planks below it, were saturated in the dark, sticky red liquid. Flies buzzed around the body, and the stench of death infiltrated all of Felix's senses. He was sure the smell alone was what woke him from his nightmare. Or his vision. He wasn't sure what he had just experienced. It felt so real, the walking through town, the interrogation, even Detective Barnes. Reality was starting to become hard to distinguish from the surreal events plaguing Burroughs. He felt tired, sluggish, listless. The events occurring were so confusing that he didn't even care to think too deeply about them. His mind wished it all away and half pretended nothing was happening. Out of the corner of his eye, a sparkling glimmer on the porch turned his head. It was a tiny shard of glass that he'd failed to clean up. The milk bottles. Stitch Mason. He needed to get to the Mason's dairy farm. He needed to know about the milk bottles. He needed to know who was placing them at random doorsteps around Burroughs. And more importantly, why? The Mason dairy farm was a five-minute drive from his home. After Felix covered Dr. Hummel's body with a blanket from his living room couch, he hopped in his car. Once he got the engine running, the lights on the dash flickered. Then the engine light, the hazards, the oil, the gas. And finally, they all stopped. The dash went black and the car died. Felix tried to turn the key again, but the darn thing wouldn't even turn over. Frustratingly, he removed the keys and slammed them into the passenger's door. It was all starting to weigh on him. The deaths, the mysterious happenings. He needed answers. What should have been a five-minute drive turned into a 15-minute walk to the dairy farm. After clearing the bend, he saw a broken mailbox with a missing flag. 
The tall, flimsy sign sat behind it with a picture of a cow. The cow painting was old and had started to chip away. Mason's Dairy Farm was the only one of its kind within 50 miles. Stitch Mason inherited the job from his father, who inherited it from his father. It was a true family business. Stitch had two boys, Harrison and Gage. They were both in their early teens and were in line to take over the business after Stitch would pass away. The history of the farm always drew attention from around the state. They'd had a steady line of cows over the years that never failed to produce anything less than quality milk. So much so that in recent years, Stitch Mason had opened up an online store where people from neighboring states could order and have it shipped directly to them from the farm. Felix walked up the driveway in fresh clothes. He knew he'd create a panic if he arrived in the clothes soaked by Hummel's blood. That's what happened in the nightmare. Felix walked up the steps, and the first thing he noticed was the hanging potted plants that surrounded the house. It was common knowledge that Stitch Mason had quite the green thumb, but they were all dead, dried and shriveled. What were once beautiful, colorful treats for the eyes were now expired, brown and rotten. The drought could have explained the plants, but so could neglected care. Felix also noticed a hose unspooled in the yard and partially embedded in the dried grass, like it had been there for a while. Felix knocked on the door, and it flung open immediately. The two teenage boys stood there just inside the darkened home, both holding shotguns with their sights set on him. Felix threw his arms up and gasped, "'Don't shoot, please!' "'Who are you?' one of them asked. "'Felix Ryder. My parents own the farm just up the road.' "'Ryder!' The boys seemed to recognize the name and relax their weapons to their sides. What do you want? Is your father home? I need to speak with him. No, one of the boys said. Both of them appeared worried, and Felix was quick to notice. They acted as if they had something to hide. Where is he? Neither boy answered. Felix then looked closely at both of the boys' skin. It was pale and dry. It peeled in certain areas, like after a bad sunburn. Where's your father, boys? Where's Stitch? The two boys hesitated, but the eldest, Harrison, finally spoke up, although softly. He went out last night to search the farm. He hasn't come back yet. Search the farm? What for? Something was out there. What was it? Don't know. It it didn't make any sense. Something. It was creeping around by the cow barn. It was walking slowly, too, Gage added. A person? Harrison shook his head, and Gage was visibly uncomfortable. It was moaning or howling or something, Harrison said. It wasn't right. Dad went out to look for it. He wanted to scare it away. Felix turned around and looked out amongst the vast pastures, crops, and barns the Mason's property was made up of. There were so many places Stitch could have gone. Stay here, Felix said. Keep the door locked. I'll go look for him. He took the four-wheeler. There's another one in that barn. Harrison said, pointing to an old barn next to the garage. Thanks, Felix said. The boys closed the door, and Felix waited to hear the lock before he hopped down from the porch and jogged over to the barn. He pushed the barn door open and was met with dust falling from the rafters. A musty smell overwhelmed him. Not disgusting, just old, like a wet cardboard box. He walked through the hay that coated the ground and over to one of the two four-wheelers left. There was an empty spot in between them from where Stitch Mason had taken one. The keys to both of them were already in the ignitions. He hopped on one and turned the key. Nothing. He tried again with the same results. The vehicle wasn't even trying to start. He climbed off and hopped on the other one. Nothing. Felix thought about his car not starting, and now these. What are the chances, he thought. He looked around the barn and saw dozens of milk crates stacked upon one another along the far wall. He walked over to them and saw that they were filled with empty milk bottles. The bottles in the crates were clear, but had noticeable blue tint in the glass. The bottoms of them had a carefully engraved Mason Dairy Farm logo. They're not the same, Felix quietly said to himself, comparing them to the milk bottles appearing around town. These were newer, sleek, They weren't dirty with old, corroded milk stains in the grooves. There was no sour odor. Those bottles didn't come from this farm. 
Felix left the barn and started across the property on foot. He passed the many cow barns, hearing the animals mooing inside, and walked along a somewhat smaller cornfield. Along the other side of the cornfield was another barn. He approached the barn and noticed it was in bad shape. The paint was actively peeling off the outer walls, and the entire thing seemed to creak and crack in the breeze. There was a dark green moss growing near the base of the barn and seemed to be on every side of it. Felix circled the barn and then called out, Hello? as he came to an opening on the back side. It wasn't a door, but a hole in the wall. The interior was dark and he couldn't really make out anything inside. A noise from inside did pique his curiosity. It was a shuffling sound. Something was inside the barn moving about. It was reminiscent of the noise in his basement. It crunched on the ground and sounded clumsy, just like the basement creeper. Stitch? Felix called out again. He was met by a blast of the all-too-familiar foul odor that he had come to despise. It blew out from the opening on the barn wall and created a feeling of nervousness in Felix. His heartbeat picked up and anxiety took over, bringing him to his knees. Shivers took over his body and he felt afraid. He didn't want to see what was stomping around inside the barn. He didn't want to know what it was anymore. The wool started low this time and grew louder and louder until Felix's ears were ringing. He became dizzy and grabbed his head, screaming in pain, Stop it! Felix screamed, Stop it! The hool came to an abrupt stop right on command, and everything went dead silent. Felix stopped screaming and slowly looked up. A small puff of dust spun out from the hole in the wall, and two white eyes, vacant of their pupils, illuminated in the darkness. Tell it, the unseen entity growled. Felix jumped to his feet and ran as the hool once again erupted like an explosion behind him, more aggressive and commanding than he had ever heard it before. Felix didn't look back. The thought of what he would see scared him deeply. He just ran until the barn would no longer be in sight. Felix stopped to catch his breath near a lone cow barn. This one was not grouped with the others close to the house. It looked like it hadn't been used in quite some time. There was an old wire fence, twisted and rusty, that encased the barn. Some of it had been flattened to the ground, and that's where Felix made his way in. He walked over the fence and up to the side of the dilapidated structure where a haphazardly built bench sprouted off from the wall. He carefully sat down on the bench and heard it crack almost immediately. As soon as he stood to his feet, the bench broke off of its rusty hinges and crumbled to the ground. Felix looked around and wasn't exactly sure where on the farm he was. He saw fields in every direction. A cold breeze then took him by surprise and he fully expected what came next. A foul odor, just like clockwork, feelings of dread and nervousness. Dizziness also tormented his brain. He knelt to the ground to try and fight the nausea that twisted his stomach. The hool was next. It traveled with the breeze, canvassing the land looking for him. Felix knew it now. He was what this thing was after. He just didn't know why. A sudden crash in the barn behind him startled Felix back to his feet. He spun around and stared at the barn as the hool blew up against his back and engulfed him. It was coming from every direction now, panning from one ear to the other, above and below. All of the sounds then met in one place, the barn he stood before. Another crash made him jump. Something was in here. Something was luring him in. And as scared as he was, Felix just had to know what it was, what it looked like, what it wanted. He put his fear aside and chose to confront the unknown. Silence took over again, leaving the creaking barn door as the center of everything. Felix pushed the door open and looked inside. He was cautious and didn't want to just waltz into certain death. He needed to do it carefully. He was dealing with the unknown after all. He peeked his head in, and the odor was overwhelming. Sour milk mixed with something else. That something else was familiar, yet hard to put a finger on. The buzzing of a swarm of flies slowly faded in, and he noticed them around something in the center of the barn. Felix crept through the door and took slow, carefully placed steps until the barn door was out of reach. 
He pushed forward and covered his mouth and nose with the collar of his shirt. The stench was rotten, and then he was finally able to identify it. It was death. The sunlight from outside acted as a spotlight coming through a splintered hole in the roof, bringing the focus solely on the three dead cows in the center of the barn. They'd been ripped open, had their eyes removed, and were soaking like sponges in their own blood. Felix stumbled backwards and tripped over an old metal pail. He fell onto his back and sloshed around on the blood-soaked floor. The ground was wet, the air was rotten and cold, and his vision darkened. The hool was inside the barn with him. It rushed over top of him, but he still couldn't see it. He could feel it touch him as it seemed to just float back and forth, releasing its horrible howl. Stop it! Please! Felix screamed as he closed his eyes. His screaming only enraged the hool, and it swelled louder. Thunder cracked outside, and the barn shook violently. Felix scurried to his feet and ran out of the old shelter. He stopped only a couple yards out of the barn. He had hit a cold spot on the property and it chilled his bones. He stared straight ahead, witnessing the surreal image of his father once again standing before him. Francis Ryder was pale. His clothes were dirty, and he held a shovel in his hand, the spade of the shovel dipping into the soil beneath him. Francis spoke without moving a muscle on his face. Don't tell it, Felix. His father's voice spoke from somewhere else. Felix didn't respond. He refused to believe what his eyes were seeing. Francis lifted the shovel and stabbed it back into the earth angrily. Don't tell it. Felix shook his head. Tears ran down his cheeks. I won't, he assured his father, even though he didn't understand his mysterious concerns. In the blink of an eye, his father was gone and Felix found himself looking at an old four-wheeler. The grass beneath it was dried and dead, maybe even burned, and weeds had grown up from underneath of it and wrapped around the wheels and sides of the idle vehicle. The man was slumped over the driver's seat, and Felix immediately recognized the man by his stature and splotchy facial hair. It was Stitch Mason. Felix rushed up to the vehicle and shook the farmer. Mr. Mason? Stitch slumped forward and Felix saw his back had been torn open. His ribs had been forced backwards through his body and protruded out and around his spine. The blood and flesh hanging from the exposed bones was dry and crawling with maggots. Felix backed away in shock. This can't be real, he thought. There was no possible way for the scene to look like this if Stitch Mason had only gone out last night. The four-wheeler looked aged and weathered and Stitch appeared long dead. Felix had quickly made his way back to the farmhouse. The front door was wide open when he got back, but he stopped before he entered. He turned around and looked out across the land. Fear began to sink its menacing teeth back into his skin, and he grew anxious. The pit of his stomach started to twist around as the occurring events began to feel like a sickening new reality. The faint sound of thunder accompanied the dark sky crawling over the horizon. It was coming back, and this time Felix didn't have the energy to hide from it. Part of him just wanted to close his eyes and forget it all. Maybe it'll just all go away. But the other part of him needed to know what was happening in Burroughs and to the people he knew and cared about. Felix walked into the Mason house, and it was disturbed by the silence. Where Harrison and Gage once were on guard with shotguns, there was now no one. No protection, no urgency to fend off the uncertain intruder. No longer did there appear to be concern for the darkness outside to invade the home through the forbidding open front door. Harrison? Gage? Felix called out as the house dimmed into a sea of shadows. Through the living room window, he watched the clouds rush through the sky like the surf of a beach. It was moving quicker than it ever had before. Something was happening. Harrison? Felix called out again, moving through the home room by room. He entered the kitchen and finally found the boys. They were sitting on the floor, propped up against the cabinets and in some obvious distress. Or at least Gage was. Harrison was a different story. He didn't seem to be okay at all. His eyes were closed. He sat completely motionless, 
and dried blood was crusted to the sides of his face, having come from inside his ears. Felix rushed to them and knelt down. What happened? Gage looked up to Felix slowly. He was as white as a ghost, and his lips were raw. His eyes drooped, and his whole body trembled. I don't know, Gage was barely able to mutter. Felix felt for a pulse in Harrison's neck, but couldn't find one. He then noticed an odd odor. First, he had subconsciously connected it to Harrison, but now he wasn't so sure. It was a damp odor, similar to mud. It was strong inside the home. Did you find our dad? Gage struggled to ask. Felix looked back down at Gage and nodded. Gage closed his eyes and leaned his head back on the cabinet. He knew his dad was dead. What's happening? I don't know. The entire house slipped into darkness. The daunting clouds in the sky blanketed burrows once again, sealing in an imminent and unimaginable horror. Thunder began to rumble from above and lightly rattled the glass inside the house. I have no idea what's happening, Felix repeated. He looked back at Gage and saw he was starting to slip away. He grabbed Gage by the shoulders and gently rocked him. Wake up, Gage! Gage opened his eyes and looked into Felix's. He was scared and also seemed to be fatally succumbing to whatever had damaged him. He didn't have any kind of fight left in him. What happened to you? Felix asked. Gage struggled to swallow and then opened his mouth to speak. It came back. What was it? Gage closed his eyes and bloody tears dripped from them. I don't know, but it didn't go far. It's searching. Searching for what? Gage opened his eyes with a new look of confusion. I, I don't know. Felix thought back to the whole reason he came to the farm to begin with. The milk bottles. Do you know anything about old milk bottles? Gage squinted. What? Something has been leaving old milk bottles around burrows, on front porches. People have stepped on them and then died. People are dying everywhere. Gage shook his head slowly. I don't know. Kind of sounds like that old milk boy legend. What milk boy legend? Gage's body began to go limp, and Felix was quick to help him sit up and straight again. What legend, Gage? It was something Dad used to threaten us with. Do your chores or, or the milk boy will take you. Who's the milk boy? Gage looked at Felix differently. He didn't understand the sudden interest in such an old story that he never believed to be anything other than a boogeyman tale. Gage, who is the milk boy? I don't really remember the, the whole story. Dad hasn't mentioned it since we were little. Felix grew frustrated. He knelt in closer and plastered his face with a dead serious look. Remember, Felix ordered. Gage desperately searched the back of his mind, but it was all too fuzzy. I, I don't... There was a, a, a boy who claimed to have found five souls of the damned. Uh, he captured them somehow, uh, locked them up. I, 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 can't, I can't remember. What else? There has to be more than that. Felix's persistence started to bother Gage. His mind began to race. Why was this so important? Gage thought back real hard to when he was young and stubborn to not do his chores around the farm. He thought back to the old story his dad, Stitch Mason, used to scare them with in the hopes that they'd just be responsible and do them. The, the damned were stolen from the boy? It drove him mad, Gage continued. He was determined to, to get them back. He was a milk boy in his town, so one morning each house he delivered the milk to, he'd go inside, and if he didn't find the souls, he'd kill the people who, who lived there. He did this until the entire town was dead. Felix was focused. Where were the souls? He never found them. Felix backed away from Gage. Thunder began to roar outside again, and the wind shook the house like a passing freight train. The house was dark, and violent lightning began to blast through the sky, flickering its blue hue throughout the kitchen. This was new. Felix looked to the light fixture swinging frantically from the ceiling, and then thought of his car and the four-wheeler Stitch Mason was on. He then looked at his watch. It was frozen at 12.01 the bodies around town, the stale stench of decay, the overgrowth of weeds around Stitch's four-wheeler in the front porch. Burrows 
was dying. A strong wind blew across the dairy farm and pounded against the house. The windows in the kitchen rattled until they popped. Glass exploded into the room and showered the floor. Felix covered his head and stood to his feet. He looked out the broken window and watched as the wind began its catastrophic damage to the farm. Lightning slithered through the black clouds like nightmarish worms and burrowed back into the darkness. With one deafening crack of thunder, Felix dropped to the ground. He thought his heart was going to burst from his chest. He looked over at Gage, who now rested his head upon his brother's shoulder. The entire Mason family was gone. The howling wind outside seamlessly transformed into the dreaded Hool, tickling Felix's nerves. Anxiety attacked his body, and he raced for the front door, blowing out onto the porch and into the front yard. He looked around as the ear-splitting whoo was more prominent than ever. It overpowered the thunder and seemed to be coming from all directions. As the twisted, pulsating lightning flared up in the sky again, Felix caught a glimpse of something perched upon the roof of the Mason's farmhouse. It was a tall, ghostly figure constructed of shadows and terror. It stood in a most awkward manner, extending its arms out to its sides, further and longer than humanly possible. It grew taller and wailed terribly under the strobing light spectacle above. It was responsible for the hool that injected dread and fear into anyone who would hear it. The lightning abruptly dispersed, and the farm fell into darkness once again. Felix could no longer see the figure which roosted upon the house. He panicked and ran as fast as he could away from the farm, leaving the frenzied howls and disembodied screams behind him. Felix had lost track of time, but it felt like it had taken forever to get back to his family's farm. Just as he hit the property line, a blinding flash of lightning and a booming crack of thunder dropped buckets of rain on burrows. Felix was soaked to the bone before he even hit the front porch. He ran and jumped up the steps, slipping on their slick surface. He fell hard, landing on his stomach, right beside the rotting corpse of Dr. Hummel. They were face to face. Hummel's eyes were open wide, his mouth agape. Out of his back, his ribcage had been pushed, encasing his spine like it was trapped in a birdcage. The front of his body had fused with the porch, creating an unnerving and gorily surreal image. Dr. Hummel looked like a piece of sloppy artwork from a deranged and vile mind. Felix stumbled to his feet realizing he twisted his ankle when he slipped. He limped to the front door and tried to turn the knob. It fell off and crumbled on the porch. Confused, he banged on the door, only to have the wood weaken and chip away under his clenched fists. He backed away from the door as the rain pounded the ground harder and harder, and the hool returned to raise the hairs on the back of his neck. He frantically looked around, dreading seeing the ghostly figure again. Desperate for salvation, he settled on the barn that sat yards away from the house. He hobbled down the porch steps again and limped as quickly as he could through the now oversaturated yard. Large puddles were forming all around him, and the lightning that tore apart the sky burned his eyes and severed every nerve in his body. Felix threw open the barn doors, and the wild lightning crashed behind him, sprawling out a flickering shadow of himself across the dirt and scattered hay inside. He rushed in, leaving the loudness of the rain behind him. It was now of a more muffled volume, but he could hear it hitting the rooftop like a barrage of bullets. He closed the doors and felt a gust of cold brush up against him. He spun around to see yet again another blip of his father's image. He stood in the center of the barn, holding a shovel and then echoed his don't-tell-it phrase once again in a raspy and demented whisper. Francis disappeared just as quickly as Felix had laid his eyes on him, leaving Felix confused and afraid, two emotions he'd become all too familiar with. He didn't know what his father was referring to. Was it a warning? A cryptic message meant to help him? He looked down at the soft, disturbed soil beneath where the apparition of his father had just stood. The dirt had been dug up and piled back on. His father wielded a shovel in every brief appearance since his death. Before his death, Francis did have a shovel in the barn. This barn. Felix had come out just days earlier to check on his father. Francis was sitting on a bale of hay. He couldn't recall why he was there. The shovel was dirty, the sour stench blew through moments later. It stunk of death. Felix hurried, limped to the small patch of bothered dirt. 
He kicked it around and then dropped to his knees. The thunder exploded outside once again as he furiously began to dig out the dirt with his bare hands. He clawed and scooped and tossed the excess dirt aside. Something hard and slick grazed his fingertips. Francis had buried something. Felix picked up his pace, thrashing his arms wildly and sending dirt flying every which way. The sickening aroma creeped back into the barn, along with a hazy mist that twirled about with a haunting elegance. A low, humming noise from behind Felix quickly accelerated into the dreaded pool and now surrounded him. It grew louder and louder as Felix dug faster and faster. It became a nightmarish howl in his ears, like thousands of damned souls screaming and screeching in pain all at once. It was resounding. Felix bit his lip until it bled and screamed back. He spun around and saw the ghostly figure again, cloaked by crawling shadows and filled with a bloody core. Felix closed his eyes, beckoning it to just go away. But it was too late. Felix felt the breath completely vacate his body, leaving it hollow and dry. He opened his eyes and stared at the hool, looking into its pale, decrepit, featureless eyes. It screamed at him, forcing Felix's eyes closed again. He saw the flashes of lightning striking through the inside of his eyelids, and the hool surged until it finally shattered. Everything went silent, and Felix felt and heard his stomach rip open. A forceful gust cracked his ribcage, pushing it back and tearing out the other side of his body. Up next on Weird Darkness, it's the conclusion to our story, The Hool by Scott Donnelly. I'm a man of habits. Okay, truth be told, my bride says I'm boring. I like the same stuff, and that's what I stick with, and that includes what I eat. Even for breakfast, I used to opt for leftover pizza, hot dogs, hamburgers. Uh, did, did I mention pizza? Anyway, now that I'm trying to lose weight and cut back on the carbs, I've had to make changes for breakfast. Now, instead of a big, heavy breakfast, I just grabbed one of my Built Bars, the best-tasting protein bar on the planet. Built Bars satisfy my hunger with up to 19 grams of protein and also satisfy my sugar craving, despite being less than 3 grams of sugar. And at only about 150 calories per bar, if I'm really hungry in the morning, I can grab two of them and still feel good about it. Try replacing your dessert, or even a meal like breakfast, with a Built Bar. You won't even know it's not really a candy bar. Visit WeirdDarkness.com Built and build a box of your own. Use the promo code Weird Darkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash built promo code Weird Darkness. Twenty hours later, just outside of Burroughs. A slick, chrome Camaro sped through the picturesque countryside of rural Wisconsin. Heavy rock music blared from the open windows. Behind the wheel was 30-year-old Eric Humphrey. One hand on the wheel, the other was swiping through the playlist on his phone. He smirked as he found the next song he wanted to radiate through the countryside. As Eric tapped the play button, an incoming call displayed the image of a woman suggestively posing in a nightgown. He answered the call, and the music paused. Hey, Casey. Hey, babe, just checking in. His girlfriend's voice came through the car speakers. Stopped for a burger about 30 minutes ago. I'm about to cross into Burroughs here now. Did you get a hold of Felix yet? No, it's weird. I can't get anyone. His phone must be dead. His parents' landline must be disconnected or something. Casey laughed on the other line. <laughs> Sounds like the town is disconnected. Eric nodded with a smile. Flex always tells me how Mayberry the place is, but he's been my friend since we were kids. He needs me. Nice little surprise drop-in should spruce up his attitude. I hope so. Make sure you tell him about my dad's offer. Will do. I can't see him saying no to the job. It, it's almost double what he was making at Tech Corp. Well, I hope he takes it. Thanks, babe. I'll call you tonight when I'm settled in. Perfect. Casey said. Love you. 
Love you. Eric ended the call, and the next song rattled the car. He bit his lip and banged his head along with the crashing drums that started the song. Eric sped past a sign that said, Welcome to Burroughs, Wisconsin, America's small town, and left it to drift away in his rearview mirror. As the wind from the speeding car died down, the Welcome to Burroughs sign began to chip and crack along its edges, and eventually crumbled to dust, falling to the rocky roadside beneath it. Eyewitness Report Transcript Burroughs, Wisconsin Discovery Site Witness Eric J. Humphrey I'd spoken with my best friend Felix Ryder only a day or so earlier. We called him Flex back home in Green Bay. He was from Burroughs. He came back here after losing his job. He wasn't too happy about that. What 30-year-old wants to move back in with their parents after living so successfully in their late 20s? The last time I'd talked to him, he was telling me about how his parents weren't doing so good. I think he was afraid that he wouldn't be able to leave them like they were, older and helpless. I asked if he'd be back for the first Packers game, which would have been a week ago now, and he said he didn't think he would. So, as any good friend would do, I was able to get my girlfriend's dad to offer him a job. I drove out to Burroughs to surprise him with a guaranteed job that he would have loved. I crossed the border into Burroughs, and everything immediately felt wrong. There was no one around. I mean, no one. It was the quietest place I'd ever stepped foot in. Cars were parked in odd places, like they had just stopped working and were abandoned. The grass and weeds around town were overgrown, and there was a wet moss that seemed to be growing all over the buildings and homes. The farms all seemed dead. No animals, no people. It smelled like old, wet grass. The sun had baked everything, which, old, which only intensified the odor. I was concerned for Felix and his parents. I drove straight to the Ryder's farmhouse and couldn't believe my eyes. I still shudder thinking about it. The dead man on the porch, he was fused to it. His rib cage had exploded out of his back. There was dried blood all over him and the porch. The front door had rotted out and was infested with bugs. I looked inside the home from the doorway and god-awful smell hit me. I gagged and ran away from the porch. I just stared at the house, breathing heavily and listening to the silence all around me. I looked over to the barn. The doors were open, so I rushed over to it, calling for Flex and his parents. I ran in, and that's when I saw him. He was on the ground, just like the man on his porch. His ribs had been pushed through his back. He was covered in blood, but it was dry too, like, like he'd been there for weeks. I heard a loud buzzing noise, and it took me a minute or two to realize the entire barn was infested with flies. They were mostly focused on Felix's body, but were definitely everywhere. Well, I ran back to my car and called 911. They had to dispatch units from Desmond, the next town over. Gave a statement to the police right away, but they said that I was unfit to give it at that time. I guess I was a, a little more than hysterical. It wasn't until I got back home to Green Bay that I started seeing stories about Burroughs on the news. The story went national and then worldwide within hours. Everyone's obsessed with what happened there, but no one has any idea what they're obsessed with. Burroughs practically went extinct, and very violently at that. I read online that everyone's cell phones were completely dead. The cars were dead, clocks and watches too. Not one citizen of Burroughs was alive, and unless they could start putting the pieces of the puzzle together, whatever happened there may never be solved. I can already see this in the history books decades from now as one of the great unexplained mysteries of the world. But there has to be an explanation. Everything has an explanation. Things like this just don't happen without reason, whether malicious or natural. I'll probably never get the answers to the thousands of questions furiously racing around in my head, bumping into one another with nowhere to go. They'll be trapped without release, and that sits very uncomfortably with me. I'll miss my friend until the day I die. Maybe only then will I know what happened. Maybe in the next life, or whatever comes after this, he could tell me what was happening at Burroughs, what he saw, and 
What could have possibly done that to him? It's an image I can't shake, and I see it every time I close my eyes. His bloodshot eyes wide open, his ribs standing upright like fence posts from his body, the stiffness in which he'd clenched his fists in the last moments. The excavation team and officials that were called in tried to fairly distribute the possessions of the borough's residents to anyone close to them. I was the closest living person to Felix and his family, I guess, so they were nice enough to send me boxes of their things. Most of the items seemed random, but at least they tried to show sympathy. It's the least they could do, I guess, after quarantining the town and kicking us out. They found an old photo album Felix's parents had under their bed. It contained pictures of me and him from our high school days. They found an old scrapbook that Felix had made in school, as well as his wrestling trophies and sports card collection. They even sent me some sort of softball-sized marble that they said that he might have tried to bury in the last moments. They thought it may have had some special meaning to him, so it'd be special to me. I don't, I don't even know what it is. There are things inside of it that rattle whenever you shake it. Casey says they're probably dead bugs or something inside because ever since that thing came into our house here in Green Bay, it's been a really foul odor that pops up once in a while. It smells sour, almost sulfuric. It smells just like that barn did on the writer's farm. But if it was important to Felix, well, it's important to me. I think I'll hang on to it. I can always hide it away in a box or even bury it in the yard if the odor gets too bad. Hell, it's just an odor. It's not like it's hurting anybody. Coming up next, it's the prequel to the story we just heard. It's The Milk Boy by Scott Donnelly when Weird Darkness Returns. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. The Settlement of Salton, sometime in the 1800s. Keep walking, boy. The deep, mysterious voice kept replaying over and over in his head. He did as it told him, though, not once questioning any motive. He wasn't sure where he was or who the voice belonged to, but he did know that he would regret it if he didn't obey it. It was a gut instinct he had follow the voice or else. He'd completely left his body and trusted the voice to guide him the correct way. He felt something gripped tightly in his hand but didn't question what it was. Everything he saw was easy and disorienting. He felt cold air but didn't remember it being a particularly cold day. Maybe it was night? It was hard to tell. The ground moved all around him, but he kept walking despite this perplexing anomaly. Further, the voice said. Things began to brush up against him, some of them scratching at his bare arms, some of them gently moving across his face. He's close, 
another voice said. This voice was deep as well, but didn't seem to come from the same person. The boy assumed the voices were talking to one another. He didn't interrupt them or ask questions. He didn't even want to speak. There was no need. The ground became bumpy, like he was walking on an infinite number of thick ropes. He knew something was off now. The feel of the ground was all wrong. Where was he? And what was that odor? A sudden gust of wind wrapped the foul odor all around him like a thick blanket. He had never smelled anything like it before in his life. It reminded him of the slaughterhouse back at his family's farm, but older, more rotten. His hand began to hurt. Whatever he gripped at his palm was starting to tear into his skin. He found the strength and opened his clenched grip. Something fell and shattered next to him. It was glass. What had he been holding? With the shattering sound, a new odor rushed up from the ground. He definitely recognized this one. Sour milk. Growing up on a farm that specialized in dairy, the smell was all too familiar to him. Is this our milk? He thought. With that idea, he started to remember things. He'd been coming from his family's farm in Salton. Doyle, the boy said out loud to himself. He now remembered his name. One of the voices responded. He's here, it then said, presumably to the other one. Let him see. Doyle then felt pressure on both sides of his head, like fingers squeezing forcibly on his temples. He was now able to see again, and the pressure quickly faded. He stood in the middle of the woods. The dead trees surrounded him on a foggy autumn morning. The odors were still very much present, as was the sight in his peripheral of the ground moving about wildly. He looked down, and the forest floor was covered in snakes. They slithered around, weaving in and out from one another, creating a bizarre sight where each snake was indistinguishable from the next. Doyle jumped to the side and away from the snakes. Their numbers started to dissipate before his very eyes, eventually leaving just one snake. It was black, and its head was shaped unlike any he had seen before. It came to a sharp point and sheltered two blood-red eyes. It hissed and slithered between Doyle's legs. He turned around to watch it more, but it was gone. Doyle looked up and was met with the most unsettling sight. Framed by a misty fog with only shadows of the woods coming through, two dead trees stood in the forefront, side by side. Two more were nestled behind those, and then one more, somewhat hindered by the fog, sat in the middle beyond that. Each tree had a rotting, decomposing body tightly secured to it by frayed ropes. The bodies had clearly been there for a while, considering their decrepit conditions. They were almost unrecognizable as former people, but the rib cages that protruded outward and the shattered skulls dripping with old skin were too hard to ignore. Doyle didn't know what to make of it. He'd been let out into the middle of God knows where to bear witness to five mutilated corpses. Why, he thought, why me? He looked around and all of his surroundings looked identical. Help! he called out, only hearing his haunting echo in return. Is anyone there? An answer never came. He turned back to face his only company, the five corpses. Who are they? He looked at them each carefully from where he stood, but couldn't make out any distinguishing features. They were all of roughly the same size and build, and their tattered clothing hung off of them, likely having been pulled at by wildlife on probably more than one occasion. Doyle slowly approached one of the first bodies. He held his breath and pulled his shirt up over his nose and mouth. The smell was awful and created a nauseating feeling in his stomach. 
He leaned as close as he could without bothering the barrage of flies and maggots that infested the mess. The ribcage was snapped in half, almost surgically. It protruded out with each individual rib coming to sharp, jagged points. He followed the ribs with his eyes, back into the messy cavity of the body and saw that they didn't even connect with the spine itself. They were fused with the tree. The spine was there, but separated from the rest of the bones, and it too seemed to have become part of the withering trunk. Who are these people? Doyle thought. How had no one noticed them before? He looked around, once again realizing his disorienting surroundings. Where am I? You have bore witness to our fates, boy. The voice spoke loud and precisely. Doyle looked around. Who said that? He called out. There wasn't anyone else around. You are now our protector. Doyle couldn't make heads or tails of the situation he found himself in. There was absolutely no one out there, only the corpses. Doyle looked at the bodies on the trees. They were lifeless, torn and rotting from the inside out. But something about them still seemed alive. They were dead, but Doyle now believed the voices were somehow vocalized from their lingering spirits. He walked closer to the one that he had already inspected. Protector? Doyle nervously asked. Flies buzzed around the skull, and maggots began to come out of the eye sockets in droves. Doyle backed away, stepping on something and rolling his ankle. He fell to the ground where the devilish serpentine struck at him. Doyle dodged the strike, and the snake slithered off again into the dead brush. He looked down to see what he'd stepped on and saw something smooth and shimmery beneath the leaves. He brushed the dead foliage aside and picked up the item. In the palm of his hands, he held a swirling marble. It was larger than one normally would be, but still sat comfortably in his open hands. A little too comfortably. Doyle looked at these swirling patterns on the smooth Dover item and concentrated deeply on them. The swirls began to stir, and he could feel it in the pit of his stomach like nervous anticipation. He felt a lump in his throat and opened his mouth to breathe easier. What is this? Doyle thought to himself. Everything. The voice was deep, gravelly, and ominous. Doyle's eyes locked onto the marble, and he fell into a trance, listening to everything it said but barely comprehending it. There were five of them, five different voices coming from the marble, all speaking at the same time and in languages Doyle didn't understand. The voices warned him as well as comforted him. They explained the hunt and the torture that left them in the woods to die. Doyle grimaced at the graphic nature of their words. Sometimes the voices would all line up and speak the same words in unison, only to each trail off in their own direction moments later. "'We're gone,' one of the voices said. "'Gone,' Doyle said out loud. He no longer found himself holding the marble or even in the woods. He stood in the kitchen of his home. His mother stirred the soup on the stove and his little sister sat in the corner playing with a wooden toy horse. "'What did you say, Doyle?' his mother asked from the stove. "'Gone? Your father?' Doyle just stared at his mother. "'This isn't where he just was. What happened to the woods, the bodies, the marble?' "'Your father went with the search party. Won't be back till late.' "'Search party?' Doyle asked. His mother turned and looked at him. "'In the woods?' for those... She motioned for Desi, Doyle's little sister, to scurry. The girl grabbed her toy and ran off. Those bodies? His mother finished. Bodies? Doyle's mother looked at him like he'd lost his mind. Are you feeling all right, Doyle? She walked over to him and put the back of her hand to his forehead. He pulled away. What bodies? Doyle aggressively asked again. His mother stood back and just stared at him. The bodies you said you saw. 
the wands tied to the trees. It was real. Being back home in the blink of an eye made him think he'd imagined the whole thing up. He looked back at his mother and nodded slowly. That's right, he said. Are you sure you're okay? His mother asked again. Doyle nodded, stood up from the table, and left the kitchen. He walked through the house until he spotted Desi sitting by the crackling fireplace. Desi, let me ask you something. He sat down by her side. His little sister held on to her toy horse very protectively. What's Daddy looking for out there in them woods? Desi's expression never changed from a concerned frown. She appeared uncomfortable around her brother. What's he looking for, huh? Doyle repeated. Desi looked down and mumbled a single word. Doyle couldn't understand her. He lifted her head with his fingers and asked again, What's he looking for? Desi stared into her brother's eyes with an emotionless gaze. Those bodies. Doyle let go of his little sister's face and stood back up. He remembered the bodies. He remembered the awful odor that filled the dead woods. He remembered the voices and the hunting down of the five men. They were bad men, practicing lives of evil and honoring an infamous fallen angel. They were not accepted by the village. They were tortured and mocked by men and gnawed on over the summer months by the rabid and feral wildlife. Doyle remembered the snake, the serpent with red eyes. Then he remembered the marble, safely kept wrapped in burlap under his bed. Doyle dashed for the stairs leaving Desi sitting by the fireplace. He flung his door open and looked at his bed. He focused on it and slowly crept up to it. He knelt down beside it and reached under his bed. Something wasn't right. The burlap was there, but it was open and laying flat on the ground, not wrapped around anything. He lifted the sheets that draped to the floor and looked under the bed. The marble was gone. You lost it one of the voices whispered. Doyle stood to his feet. The consequences will be dire, another one said. A mess of other voices began to yell and scream all at once, and Doyle grabbed his head and shut his eyes. He grinded his teeth together as hard as he could until the screams came to an abrupt stop. Doyle? He heard his father's voice behind him. Doyle spun around and looked at his father. He stood there in the middle of the woods with a wool newsboy hat and a rifle over his shoulder. The two other men were quick to join his side. "'That's your boy, Claude?' one of the men said. Claude approached his son, who appeared disoriented and lost. "'Your mama know you're out here?' Claude said, as he reached his arm for his son's shoulder. Claude was flung backward by an unseen force. He screamed until he forcefully smacked into a tree. The sound of all of his bones shattering at once exploded in Doyle's ears. He tried to reach out for his father, but he couldn't move a muscle. The two other men were then yanked backwards by the same invisible force. Both of them landed on their backs and Doyle watched as their rib cages exploded outwards. Blood gushed like geysers, and then the ribs folded back into the bodies and out the back, lifting the men off the ground. Blood poured from the corners of their mouths and their eyes rolled into the back of their heads. Doyle couldn't do anything. He was paralyzed. He tried to scream but only could expel a painful, hollow wheeze that stung his throat and sent a cold pain through his eyes. He closed them tightly to ease the building pressure. He strained to keep them closed, but what felt like sharp hooks under his eyelids ripped them right back open. Doyle was in his room, staring at the empty burlap cloth in his hand. Find it one of the gravelly voices said. If what he had just witnessed was any indication of the consequences of not protecting the mysterious item he'd found in the woods, he knew he needed to find it. Doyle rushed back down to the kitchen where his mother ladled the soup into small wooden bowls for him and Desi, who now sat at the table. Mama, did you take anything from under my bed? She looked at him with concern. She'd been crying what's wrong? he asked. His mother sniffled. Her eyes were red and glassy. Doyle then turned to his sister. 
he saw Desi had also been crying. She stared blankly down at her bowl of hot soup. He then noticed she was in a different outfit than moments earlier when he spoke with her by the fireplace. He glanced into the other room and saw there was no fire. The house was unusually cold, and the lingering scent of a fire that would normally grace the house during the fall seemed to be absent. "'What's going on?' Doyle pleaded, growing afraid. He was missing periods of time. "'Where's Papa?' His mother broke down to the floor and wailed. Desi jumped down from her chair and hugged her mother tightly. "'Where's Papa?' Doyle repeated, louder this time. He ran out the door in the kitchen and stopped as soon as the brisk temperatures outside smacked his face. The air was cold. He could smell burning firewood around the village, and smoke billowed gently from chimneys. Men were working and children played, chasing each other during a game of tag. The dreary clouds that hung overhead threatened rain or even snow. There was another chill in the air, a more dreaded one. A sinister shiver erupted throughout Doyle's body. He felt afraid and angry. His marble was gone. He looked around the village accusingly, assuming someone had stolen it. He charged back into the kitchen, infuriated. "'Who is in our house?' Doyle demanded to know. His growl confused and upset his mother. She stood from the floor and wiped the tears from her face. Desi remained on the floor, sulking. "'Who was in here?' he questioned again. "'What do you mean?' his mother cried. "'Who's been in our house recently?' His mother just stared at him. She was so visibly upset. Did, did we have a gathering for, for father? His mother continued to look on in disbelief. Desi looked to the floor and mumbled, You weren't here for it. Doyle looked at his sister. Look at me, Desi. She kept her eyes down. Look at me! He yelled in a deeper, grittier voice, one that was not his own. Desi looked up instantly. What's that smell? his mother said. Doyle looked at his mother and she repeated her question, only her mouth didn't move. What smell? He heard another voice. It was his own. It was muffled and coming from the living room area. He turned around and faced the darkened doorway that led to the living room. He took a step towards it and entered the dimly lit living area. His mother stood by the closet. She had the door opened, revealing two wooden crates filled with milk bottles. The air in the room was sour. Doyle walked in closer, surprised by the sight. He thought for sure he had delivered those. He looked at each of the bottles. There were eight to a crate. Sixteen undelivered milks to his neighbors and acquaintances in Sultan. I don't understand you, Doyle. His mother sounded emotionless, hollow, almost like she didn't know what she was saying but was still saying it anyway. You didn't come to your father's memorial gathering. The whole town was basically here to pay their respects, and you were nowhere to be found. And now this milk, that's three days' worth of undelivered milk, people count on that milk. All Doyle heard and focused on was his mother's words of, the whole town was basically here. Here is home. Anyone could have taken that marble. It could have been anyone in town. Doyle didn't respond to his mother's frustration. A calming sensation overcame him, and he fell into a state that seemed to lift his soul from his body. He didn't care what his mother had to say. It didn't matter. He was the protector of the five souls he'd found in the woods. He needed to protect them. He needed to find them. I'll have the conclusion of Scott Donnelly's The Milk Boy when Weird Darkness Returns.
What goes on in the mind of a murderous killer? What is it about some people that lead them to commit murder? Is there something that is different or is it simply a switch that gets turned on? Murderous Minds, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines offers a look into the lives of individuals who didn't just become killers, but who managed to avoid the media storm that usually accompanies them. Inside, you will hear about people like Sante Kimes, a 65-year-old mother who was driven by greed and who committed multiple murders with her son. Robert James Ackerman, the MBA graduate who murdered three people in order to continue getting lap dances from a stripper that he became infatuated with. Larry Jean Ashbrook, who became deluded into thinking that strangers were accusing him of murder. When he could not take it anymore, he carried out a massacre at the Wedgwood Baptist Church. And more. Each story harbors its own distinct narrative and reasoning for the perpetrators of these heinous crimes, along with the background to the case, their lives, and the aftermath of their actions. Sometimes the truth is more appalling than anything fiction can provide, and Murderous Minds proves it once again. Murderous Minds, Volume 1, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines by Ryan Becker Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample or purchase the title on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Doyle lay in bed all night, wide awake and unable to sleep. His body fought off any fatigue he might have felt, and he trembled with a dark anticipation. He wasn't exactly sure what his body had sensed or what it may have been anxious about, but he did know by dusk of the coming day he would have what he needed. Door to door was the only way. The rooster from down the way screamed as the autumn sun broke the horizon and shot through the woods like lasers, landing its light on the rocks and dirt all over town. A wispy fog began to lift from the ground, although slowly in the cold temperatures, and cast an eerie ambiance to the streets. A quiet, unknown sense of dread was building, and the townsfolk were ignorant to it. They went about their mourning as they normally would, Mothers ushered their kids to the schoolhouse. The working fathers suited up and set out for their jobs. The lone postman walked his horse to the station, and Doyle stood outside his front door. In each hand he held the wooden handles to the milk crates. Sixteen spoiled milks clinked against one another as he stepped away from the door and walked to his neighbor's house. He stopped and looked around, making sure no one was watching him. He set the crates down and pulled a bottle from one of them. He gently sat the bottle on the porch step and knocked on the door as he had done a hundred times before. Doyle had changed. He was emotionless and determined. The marble was the only thing on his mind. He hadn't heard the voices in what felt like days. He needed guidance. He was lost. He tried to communicate with the five souls, but when he opened his mouth to speak, he couldn't. His throat was dry and the air that came from his lungs scraped his esophagus. It hurt like hell and he let out a gutty wheeze instead. He then knocked on the door. It opened a moment later and an old woman, Miss Mary Ellen, stood there. She looked at Doyle and then down at the milk. She had a look of sympathy behind her gaze. I didn't get to see you at your home after your father's passing, Doyle. I'm so sorry for your loss. It was tragic. Doyle didn't respond. He held his hand out, palm up, hinting at the tip that Mary Ellen would usually slip him. It wasn't necessary, but she always insisted. She smiled when she looked at his palm. Of course. Hold on. Mary Ellen turned and vanished into her home. 
Doyle dropped his hand and walked in right behind her. He closed the door almost all the way, but avoided the clicking of it shut. Mary Ellen stood on the other side of the room, fishing through a small drawer for her money. She was oblivious to Doyle walking in the room behind her. He looked on the tables and shelves. He looked at the small kitchen table sitting in the other room. He then looked up toward the ceiling and wondered if she was keeping the artifact hidden under her bed like he had. She turned around and saw Doyle standing ominously in the room, looking upward. The unexpected sight made her heart jump and she grabbed her chest and then smiled in relief. I didn't know you were there, Doyle. Mary Ellen laughed off her scare and handed the money out to him. Doyle just stared at it. Where's my marble? he asked impassively. Mary Ellen was confused. What do you mean? Don't play dumb with me, Doyle growled in a voice that wasn't his own. It's missing. You were in my home. Mary Ellen began to tremble. This wasn't the little Doyle she knew from next door. This was someone else, something else. Oh my, she stuttered. Doyle, I think you... Doyle charged her and pushed her into the wall. Her fragile body collapsed to the floor and she screamed out in pain, dropping the coins. They spun around and around and then finally rested next to her. Mary Ellen grabbed her chest. My ribs! she bellowed. Doyle looked to the corner and saw fire poker. He grabbed it and held it firmly in his grip. He then stood before Mary Ellen, who painfully screamed on the floor. She looked up at her young attacker and noticed his eyes were different. They burned with anger and gave off a reddish appearance. Being a woman of religion, she knew what she was looking into the eyes of, and it wasn't little Doyle from next door. He was gone. Devil, she whispered. Doyle raised the fire poker and smashed it down into Mary Ellen repeatedly. The room was covered in blood, and he left a trail of bloody footprints as he ascended the stairs to the second floor. He scoured the two rooms upstairs, leaving bloody handprints everywhere, but came up empty-handed. The marble wasn't there. Doyle left the house, closing the door behind him, and picked up the two crates of spoiled milk. He calmly walked to the next house. He set the crates down, put a bottle of milk by the door, and knocked. The door opened, and a small child stood there. The young boy looked at Doyle, who had been speckled by the blood of Miss Mary Ellen. The young boy didn't know how to respond. Who is it, Sammy? A woman's voice called from inside the house. Sammy didn't respond to his mother, he just stared at the milk boy. Doyle forced his way in and spun yet another mess of blood as he violently tore through the home. The marble wasn't there, either. He went to the next house, killed the older man who lived there, and scoured the house. Nothing. He then moved on, repeating his actions in each home. He finally arrived at a small cottage near the edge of the woods. He sat a milk by the door and then knocked. A man opened the door. Doyle knew this man. His family had seen him every Sunday for the past several years. He was a man of God, and Doyle's once innocent eyes now burned at him. He also knew this man had a son with a history of causing disorder and carrying out petty crimes unbeknownst to his parents. Doyle? Pastor Frank mumbled upon seeing the blood-soaked youngster at his doorstep. What's happened to you? Where's Henry? Doyle boldly asked. Pastor Frank noticed Doyle's eyes were as red as his clothes. They didn't blink and appeared to not even make eye contact with him. Frank grew afraid immediately. What do you want with Henry? I need to see him, Frank! Pastor Frank sensed a vile presence that accompanied Doyle's physical appearance. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath, knowing deep down what he was dealing with. Frank's eyes shot back open and he said, "'You need to refer to me as Pastor Frank.' Doyle didn't respond. "'Call me Pastor Frank,' the man of God repeated louder. Doyle still didn't respond. He stared past him and into the house. The pastor's wife sat at a table, frozen in fear as she watched her husband and Doyle speak. "'I am a man of God, Doyle,' Frank said. "'You must honor that!' Frank slowly reached off to the side, just out of view from the doorway, 
and grabbed a cross that hung on the wall. Doyle growled and pushed Pastor Frank hard in the chest. The man flew backwards and crashed into the table his wife sat at. She screamed and stood up in a panic. Doyle slammed the door shut behind him as he walked in, shaking the walls and dropping the cross to the floor. He approached Frank and saw the splintered table had pierced through his body and shards of it stuck straight up out of his body. Doyle ripped one of the shards of wood from Frank's body and approached his wife, who whimpered and cried in the corner of the room. He stood over her menacingly, and she shook in fear as she looked up into his eyes. "'Where is your son?' Doyle asked. The pastor's wife didn't know what to say. She didn't understand why Doyle had just killed her husband. "'Where is your son?' Doyle repeated. Her voice trembled as she quietly muttered, "'He, he left, left for Rustic Farms last night.' Rustic Farms? Doyle had heard of Rustic Farms. It was another settlement, very much like Sultan. Why did he go there? Doyle asked. The pastor's wife was terrified. She didn't know what Doyle's intentions were or why he was there. But she did notice something was off with him. This is not the same Doyle that she had seen every Sunday. Something had taken a hold of him, and it wasn't of the natural world. The scriptures her family had studied for years warned of evil like this, like the kind hidden behind the red eyes Doyle now so comfortably possessed. "'Come back, Doyle,' she whispered. Doyle was not having any of it. He lifted the bloody shard and impaled the pastor's wife. Her scream shook the house, but it did not rattle him. Doyle turned around and left the house, leaving the pastor's wife to bleed out and die. As he exited the home and walked across the street, her screams became faint and eventually stopped. Doyle stumbled across the dirt street, feeling lightheaded and seeing flashes of blood and the bodies that he'd been surrounded by. He saw images of the five men tied to the trees in the woods and fresh blood pouring from them. He watched once again as his father violently died before him. He heard screams and a hollow wailing that terrified his soul. He felt the darkness follow him out of the pastor's home and loom overhead like a stalking storm. Doyle saw images of his mother and his little sister, dead. He wouldn't hurt them. Those were just images in his mind. They weren't real. He looked around and found himself back home. The light outside gave the impression of dusk approaching. He'd lost track of the entire day. He sat in the kitchen, and all he could smell was blood. It covered him from head to toe and covered the floor and walls of the kitchen. In one of his hands he saw a bloody knife. He gawked at it, wondering when and how it had gotten there and what he might have used it for. Doyle then heard a child's whimper from the living room. Fearing it was his sister in distress, he jumped up from the seat in the kitchen and rushed to the living room where he saw Desi lying by the fireplace a red fire crackling behind her. He rushed to her side and saw her body had been ripped to shreds. One of her eyes was closed, but the other one wriggled back and forth inside of her head. One last weak cough from her little body sent a mist of blood onto Doyle's face. She now lay still, dead by the fire. Doyle looked at the knife in his hand, frightened. He made the assumption that his little sister had died by his own hands. His mother was dead too. He just knew it. And he was also to blame. Doyle stood up in a daze and walked to the rocking chair in the corner of the room. Silence filled the house, as well as all of Sultan. He dropped the knife to the floor and started to slowly rock back and forth in the chair. His eyes were lifeless as they gazed into the red fire before him. Voices came from the fire now. They told him he had failed in being the protector of the damned. His search through Sultan left him with nothing to show for his work. The marble was gone. Stolen. He needed it back. There was no other option. Doyle rocked back and forth in the chair, and the wood beneath him creaked. Time passed, and the settlement of Sultan drifted away. The years creeped by, and nature took control of the town no one was left to care for the grass, so it grew sloppy and wild. 
rain dampened the homes to the point where moss began to grow all over the walls, inside and out. Wildlife found their way to Sultan and fed off the mutilated corpses of the town's former residents. Doyle still sat in the rocking chair, but it no longer creaked or moved. He was now a lifeless shell of the boy he used to be. His skeletal remains sat upright in the chair as the rotting skin from his body had dripped off long ago. His eyes were still red, and a haunting sense of anger and desperation still loomed around his body. There had been so much blood on his hands, so many accusations and punishments handed out, but he had nothing to show for it. His spirit lingered in unrest. Finding the marble was the only thing that plagued his mind. In life, Doyle Salton's young and respected milk boy could not prove himself to the damned the chosen. But in death, he had an eternity to do so. Up next on Weird Darkness, it's a story from Edwin Crow called My Father Punished Me When I Talked to Ghosts. That story and many others still to come. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. My Father Punished Me When I Talked to Ghosts by Edwin Crow. I've been blind since birth. As I grew up, everything was described to me in such vivid detail that I didn't even realize why it was that important to see especially having no reference point to compare it. We lived in a single-floor ranch house, that's what my father told me. In my mind, of course, I could see, although unlike how a sighted person could. I had spatial awareness, I knew where my bedroom was, where the bathroom, living room, and kitchen were. Each wall had its own texture. I don't know if that was done on purpose or if I could feel things others never noticed. I rarely fell over. Only if father or one of the visitors put something somewhere they shouldn't have. It was usually the visitors, and father would shout. They visited infrequently, and only briefly when they did. Father said I shouldn't speak to them, that it unsettled him. He'd worry when I saw something he didn't, saw it with my ears or by touch. Ellie was the first. She seemed very sweet. She asked me my name and why my face was so messed up. She was in the living room. I could see where she sat from her breaths. Harsh, nasal sounds, as if her nose was blocked. When father had a cold, he'd always breathe through his mouth, big, labored breaths as he wasn't used to it. People would mention my face. I always touched it, trying to work out why it was so strange to them. When I asked if I could touch theirs, there was always a pause. I guess sighted people never did that. Why would they need to? When I asked Ellie if I could touch her face, she reluctantly agreed. 
but moments later father entered the room and asked me who I was speaking to. I told him, nobody. He'd always punish me when I spoke about them. I think it scared him. He'd take my arm and march me off. I'd be knocked off balance and disoriented, to the point where when he finally set me down my hands would frantically search my surroundings until I knew where I was. It was usually my bedroom, though every now and then he'd leave me outside in the middle of nowhere. That was the worst. I'd be lost and scared. He told me about the road that ran in front of the house and explained that the sounds I heard were cars, that they'd kill me if they touched me. Those sounds were my only means of recognizing my surroundings. I waited until I heard one and then knew which way to run back to the house. I heard Ellie that evening. She whispered to me, saying she was scared. I whispered back, but she didn't hear. I asked father about Ellie. He didn't want to talk about her. I asked him why. He didn't reply. When I told him that she asked about my face, he asked me how I responded. I told him I wanted to touch hers. He laughed, though I knew he wasn't happy. I could hear the difference. When you laugh for pleasure, your mouth is wide open. When you pretend, your mouth is almost closed. To me, the difference is obvious. It wasn't until I was older that he explained. He said we lived in a special place connected to the other world. But sometimes dead people slip through, people who died in pain and wanted to reach the living. He explained that because I couldn't see, I was able to tune into that, that they knew I was listening when others weren't. He said I had to ignore it. Otherwise, he told me they'd latch on and never leave me. All the dead want is to be alive again, he said. It was dangerous and they would trick me. He said he knew how to deal with them, but he couldn't help if they became attached to me. Alex appeared to me a few years later. She told me she was lost and didn't know where she was. I told her I wasn't allowed to speak to her. Still, she pleaded for help. I kept quiet, knowing what would happen if I said anything. Did you speak to them? Father asked. Though I was upset, I told him no. I wished I could help her. I knew what it was like to be lost, and it scared me. Alex didn't whisper to me at all. I'd ignored her, and she ignored me. Father saved me, and I was thankful. After Alex, I knew what I needed to do, so I did it. The spirits stopped bothering me after that for a very long time. That was until Sarah appeared. Sarah didn't give me a chance to be quiet. I was on my own, sitting in the living room and listening to television. Help, she said. I need to find a way out. I stayed silent. You can hear me, can't you? She asked, surprised. I'm not allowed to speak to you, I told her. Please, she begged. I'm scared. I'm lost. I want to see my daddy. I gripped the arm of the chair and I told her I wasn't allowed. He's dead, she said. I didn't answer. Your father is dead, she said again. I wasn't going to fall for it. I heard banging from around the room as things began to fly and the shelves began to shake. Stop it! I shouted, and it did. Please help me leave, she said. I wasn't going to talk to her. I did the only thing I thought would help. I unlocked the front door, hoping she'd run out and get lost, just like I would do. When I heard from her no more, I locked the door and sat back down. I listened intently for any signs she was still there. Except for the sounds of the TV, it was silent. I hated when my heart raced. I became all too aware of the tick-tock feeling of the rise and fall within my chest, like it was about to explode. When I heard my father's voice, I screamed. Son, he said, I need your help. I think I'm dying. I did what he told me to do. I didn't speak. If he did die, he'd never leave me. Instead, I raced out into the open air and shouted for help. 
I shouted until my voice was hoarse. I heard the sounds of cars racing along the road in front of my house. I shouted until I heard someone respond. It was a woman. What's wrong? They asked. I told them I think my father was dying. They asked what had happened to my face. I pleaded with them to help me and they promised they would. I sat down on the grass and waited. Some time later, the woman returned to me and asked if she could hold my hand. I'm so sorry, she told me. I heard the sounds of sirens and of people rushing. I asked what was going on. The woman said that she was there for me. As the noise died down, a man asked me a question. I'm a paramedic, he said. What happened to your face? I told him I was fine. He asked me if I was sure, and I told him I was. He asked if I minded him touching my face, and I said it was okay. A moment later, I felt a pressure release from around my forehead, and the air felt cold against my skin. It sounded as if they were peeling an orange. I imagined that in my head and worried he'd expose my insides. I screamed and asked what he was doing. He told me everything was going to be okay, and the woman squeezed my hand, telling me to be brave. I didn't know what I was experiencing. I felt a tight pain within my head, like when you smash your shin against something hard, followed by something I've come to understand as bright. It hurt so much I began to cry. What happened to your eyes? The paramedic asked. I said I was blind. He asked to check them. The pain returned when he examined them. Do you know him? The man asked the woman who had helped me. She told him that I'd been screaming for help and that she'd come to my aid, but that she had never met me before. How long have you had your eye injury? He asked me. I told him I'd been blind from birth. He asked me if I could see his fingers. I told him no. He asked if I could open my eyes. I said I didn't know what he meant. He asked me if he could open them for me. I didn't respond, and then I felt his fingers on my face. Fingers covered in something rubbery. Suddenly it became bright again, and I screamed. He tried to calm me. The woman squeezed my hand again. I didn't know what was happening. Things I couldn't describe came to me. It was like it always was, but multiplied a hundredfold and so much more real. I carried on screaming as a fuzzy form came into view. Just breathe, okay? The paramedic said. Everything will be fine. When was the last time you saw? As my heart began to calm and my breathing slowed, I became distracted by what I was experiencing. It overwhelmed me. I, I wanted to cry, and I did. How long has it been? He asked again. I've never seen anything before, I told him. I was told to keep an eye mask on for most of the day, only taking it off at night at first to allow my eyes time to adjust. At the same time, I was placed in the custody of my aunt and uncle and didn't even know it at first. They were shocked at what happened to me and that I had never attended school. The past few years have been a roller coaster ride. The doctors said I may never have perfect vision, though what little I have is a godsend and I'll take what I can get. I've only recently been learning to read and write, so I apologize if my English isn't the greatest. It's the best I can do. I've been asking my aunt what happened to my father, but all she says is that he died of a heart attack. I asked what sort of man he was. She says he was her brother, and she'll love him no matter what. My uncle doesn't want to talk about him at all. I've been using the computer a lot recently, really enjoying the internet. I can't believe such a thing exists. After being so lonely for so long, I, I can talk to whoever I want, when I want, though I am wary of that. After all, how do I know if who I'm speaking to is alive? No one seems to share my father's concerns about that. Today I was on a forum discussing the spirit world. I was so happy to find people who I could relate to, and someone curious about my username sent me a link to an article on a true crime website. It was about my father and mentioned me by name. They asked me who I was and if I was the same person. 
According to the article, my mother had gone missing soon after my birth. It said I'd been bound so that I couldn't see, that my father always wanted a daughter. They found 14 bodies in the basement. They said one got away, a girl by the name of Sarah Frank. She was the one to call the police. They found father's car parked around the back of the house. They supposed he carried his victims into the basement via the storm entrance and just left them there. Sarah had managed to get away after she agreed to be his daughter following four days of sustained torture. She stabbed him with a knife that he'd placed on the counter to butter some toast. I didn't want to believe it. And I'm not sure I would have if it weren't for the names of the victims, two of which stuck out. Ellie Farmer and Alex Riddle. I'd spoken to them both in the living room. To this day, I wonder if my father had been honest with me about a single thing in his life. Throughout it all, one question remains above all others. Did I speak to Ellie and Alex before or after he killed them? Weird Darkness continues in just a moment with a story from Maddie Kate called In Our Town, up next. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. In Our Town by Maddie Kate. In our town, you prayed for a boy when you first felt that kick in your belly. Mama said she'd cried the day I came out of her. She was so happy she'd been blessed because I was a son. Every birthday was a celebration for us. Whole family coming around with sweet cakes and rye whiskey, friends and neighbors filling our back porch. My gramps would bring us guitar. One played on special days since his hands were lost to arthritis. We'd stay up until the stars showed, everyone drinking, my uncles pouring out baby drinks for us young ones in tin cups, everyone laughing in the bonfire light, coyotes howling in the blacktop mountains behind the fence that separated our backyard from the edge of the tree line. Birthdays were a cause for joy, a reminder that sometimes God listened to your prayers, didn't always make you suffer. Birthdays for my cousin Lila were a different affair. She was three and some years older than me. She'd babysit when my parents would go out dancing, as if those three years between us meant much more than the fact that she was a head taller and always beat me at hide-and-seek. She had long strawberry hair our grandma would brush out in front of the TV for her. Lila loved watching quiz shows, so sharp she'd always know the answers before they came up on screen. I half believed her when she'd wave her hands in the air in front of her face and tell me she wasn't smart, just psychic. Grandma would always hush her and say that she shouldn't joke about such things, but she'd wink at Lila and smile. When I was really small and couldn't sleep, she'd sing to me, old songs about apple trees and drowned lovers, songs that her mama had sung to her. 
I could never remember the words. Some nights I'd lie awake in the dark and try singing to myself, but the sounds got stuck in my chest, buried too deep to dig out. Lila was also the only one my parents would let take me swimming in the creek around the back of Gramps' farm where nobody could bother us. My uncles offered time and again, but Mama always refused, laughing and pouring another beer to pacify their pride, saying they were more likely to drown me than show me how to float. Lila was the one that taught me to swim, hands ever patient and holding my head above the water when I went under for too long. Swim, Ren! You gotta swim! she would say as she pulled me to the surface. On her birthdays, the women would go over in the early morning, sitting around her and her mother, overlapping arms in their cotton print sundresses, offering what little comfort they could, sipping berry wine and praying occasionally, hands all tangled in the wooden rosaries they carved in the winters. Mama would be up the night before, baking sweetbreads and whiskey doughs. My daddy always told me to stay out of the kitchen on baking days. Baking days were just for Mama, when she'd get out all her grief and pour it out into the food that she made for her sister, each dish an apology, a comfort, an acknowledgement of loss. Us men and boys would go over in the evening and sitting silent and smoking around Lila's old man and her stepbrothers, tobacco passing between uncles and cousins and all the things that went unsaid. On Lila's birthdays, everyone was drinking for a different reason. Bittersweet. In our town, birthdays were a reminder of another year gone, another year closer to the day we die. In our town, you were only safe once you turned 18, down to the hour. In our town, once there was blood between your legs, you only had so many summers left. In the old days, my gramps told me it used to be once every six years. The town would go down to the lake on the last Sunday of the summer, dressed in white or the closest you could get, everyone lining up along the banks to wash their hands clean in the water. And then a name would be drawn. Somebody's daughter, sister, lover, cousin. A girl next door, a girl you'd grown up with someone with dreams about seeing the world outside the state lines, someone with favorite songs and best friends and promises to keep. The girl would walk into the lake and would be held by her mama for the last time, the woman she was grown from dipping her low into the water so she shone in the sunlight, skin dripping. She'd smile for her daddy, despite the tears he'd catch with his hands, so he'd remember her well. Then, she would start to swim, out into the middle of the water until she reached the other side, the one always lost in the mists, even in deep summer. Nobody had ever seen the other side, even from the boats. It was something you stayed away from, the current always tugging you back, a warning, and she'd never be seen again. The thing was, it wasn't the old days anymore. Grandma told me things started going wrong in the gaps between those six years, just after my parents and aunts and uncles had graduated high school. Lambs being born with the skin around their eyes green, blind from the moment they came into the world. Dogs howling for days on end until their lungs collapsed and they died from exhaustion. People waking up with dead moths covering the floors of their hallways, piled so deep you couldn't see the carpet beneath them. At first, people just came to accept that something in the trees was changing and, for whatever reason, was throwing things a little off balance. Then the rains stopped. People began to worry, but put it down to a dry spell and nothing more, despite the fact that the rain came every October without fail and had done so since people first lived here back in the days of candlelight and wagons, before the trees were tamed. Then the cows started milking blood and the dirt started turning black, swallowing anything planted. Then the babies started being born without their legs or their arms or their eyes. My Uncle Jonah was born legless, Mama's youngest brother. Gramps said it didn't matter because he could drink like a man standing up. I liked Jonah best. He was always loud, laughing and cracking jokes that had everyone clutching their sides like their ribs were about to split their organs on the floor. 
He had a voice like Johnny Cash, and you could tell Gramps was proud when he sang along with his guitar, because when Jonah sang, everyone would forget about his legs a while. But he could be quiet, too. Could convince birds down from the trees to eat out of his hand. Sometimes I'd catch him looking real sad, though. Watching me and my cousins playing tag, or watching his brothers dance with their wives. So Grandma said that six years became four years, and it was okay the first time. But then the lake started to dry up, and things started washing up on the shore. Baby bones and drowned rabbits with too many eyes. Deer started getting bloodthirsty, running out of the woods with their eyes white and teeth sharp, stealing chickens. People had to stop fishing out on the water because when they would drag up their nets, they'd be full of snakes. They would toss them back, but a few always made it to shore. One of them found their way into church and bit the preacher right on the wrist. The preacher bashed its head in with his Bible. Old folks started sleeping at night, lining up on the edge of the lake and waking up in the morning with no memory of walking there, barefoot, feet all cut up and muddy. So four years became two years. And that was okay the first time, too. But people started getting scared to bring their babies into this world, and so parents stopped having kids. People started seeing things in the mist. Then the dreams started. My best friend Tommy's dad was one of those that had the dreams. I went with him to the cemetery a couple of times to visit when we were kids. Tommy always brought one of his Power Rangers or a race car to leave on top of the grave in case his daddy got bored in heaven, even though there wasn't actually a body down in the ground. Tommy said he didn't know what the dreams were about and that his mama wouldn't tell him. Grandma wouldn't tell me either, but she said the dreams made 30 people real sad and that they couldn't stop feeling sad, so they all swam into the lake one day and they didn't stop until they reached the bottom. So, two years became once a year, and the rains came back, and people started sleeping better, and people started fishing on the lake again, and the flowers grew a little brighter, and the air a little warmer, and the high school football team suddenly won every game. The mini-mart that had been on the edge of closing down suddenly sold fruit so good people would drive in from towns over to buy it. Cherries like drips of blood, peaches soft enough to be skin, and everywhere over the town the apples heaved with offerings. And yet, families lived in constant fear of having a daughter. Like all of them were walking around with hunting knives twisted deep in their spines that they just had to bear. Little girls grew up walking around with grief so heavy it would break their back if they had understood what was coming for them when they grew up. It was Lila's 15th birthday when she was nowhere to be seen. Her mama Clara was crying on a lawn chair, sipping some lemonade she had pressed with me and Lila the night before, hands sweet with sugar and rind. Clara was my mama's younger sister, but she looked years older lines pressed into her face from years of holding all that sorrow just beneath the surface. When she laughed, though, you could see her true age, smile lines softening around her eyes as she grinned, hair coming loose from the tight braid she normally pulled it back in. Lila loved to make her laugh, was often the only one that could. Mama and her sisters-in-law sat around her, long-legged and stretched out in the afternoon sun, couple of my baby cousins tugging at the bottoms of their frayed jean shorts for attention or hanging off their hips. Daddy sat with my Uncle Red, Lila's father, hand resting on his plaid-clad shoulder. None of her friends had come to her birthday party, and she'd run off heartbroken. The year before last summer, Sky, Lila's best friend since the first day of school, had her name pulled. None of her friends could face another birthday party that could be any of their last before they headed out across the water, so it had been a no-show. Candles and cake lay melting, untouched, dripping off the pine table Red had made way back when, and there was more than just lemonade in Clara's glass. But I knew where to find her. I walked to our grandparents' farm in the low-slung sunlight, 
kicking up dust trails with the tops of my sneakers, scattering the June bugs, still sucking on the flowers even though June was long gone. The farm was empty except for the cows. I lowered my head as I passed them, white-bellied with their long eyelashes keeping away the flies. I hated the way the cows watched you pass, eyes all-knowing as they stood so still, all of their heads turning to watch you go. Grandma said sometimes it was best not to look at cows, just to let them get on with their business. She told me I had nothing to worry about for as long as I didn't turn around once they were behind me. They didn't take kindly to that. As I walked, I could feel them watching me in the heat. Grass, a hush around my legs as I walked through the fields and past the barn with its peeling red paint. Lila was floating in the middle of the creek, hair around her head like strings of bloody flowers. She looked so peaceful with her belly up to the sun, eyes closed and trailing her hands through the lily weeds. I called her name and she didn't move. Behind me, something rustled in the tall grass, maybe a snake or a rabbit. I called again, voice drunk up by the fields. She was dead, I knew. Kicking my shoes off and running out to her, ready to push the water from her lungs, bring her back. I fell into the water, throwing my shirt behind me, yelling her name. She flipped over and turned to face me. Ren, calm down, I was just daydreaming. She half smiled, pushing her hair from her face. I splashed her, sending an armful of the creek over her head. You scared me, she laughed, splashing me back, both of us fighting until we could hardly breathe for laughing and the water in our mouths. Everyone's looking for you at the party, I told her. She shrugged and turned to float belly up again, toes stretching out to kick at the butterflies skimming the surface. I joined her, drifting. We spent the afternoon together, swimming and daydreaming and trying to catch the tiny fish that lived in the mud with our hands. As the sun went down behind the barn and the creek turned cool and green, we lay out at the bank in our underwear, letting the sunset warm us dry. Lila turned to me. The lights in the farmhouse were on, porch lit and beckoning us home. You gotta promise me some things, all right? When I'm gone, I... I cut her off. Where are you going? Can I come? She didn't reply, just carried on as if I'd said nothing. When I'm gone, I need you to promise me you won't ever go swimming with anyone else. And if you try out for the football team, shower when you get home, okay? Don't ever drink and drive or your daddy will kill you. Be nice to girls, but don't start dating until you're out of school. Don't let them get in your pants either. Trust me on that one, us high school girls got nothing to lose. Kiss your mama goodnight. Listen hard to grandma when she tells you stories because most of them are truer than you could ever know. Make Jonah teach you how to get birds in your hands because he never had the time to teach me and now I'll never get to know. She smiled, but it wasn't in her eyes. Her voice wobbled a little toward the end. And tell my mama about me every once in a while. You don't have to do much, just sit with her sometimes and, and talk. I don't want her to forget. She jumped to her feet, then ruffled the hair on top of my head, messing it up like she had done since we were little. She ran off into the purple dark, long-legged with her hair out behind her. It was the last time I ever saw her. The day Lila was chosen, I was in church with all the other kids who weren't allowed down to the lake on the last Sunday of summer. Me and Tommy and his cousin Beth were seeing who could run the fastest, racing down the wedding aisle sunlight streaming through the high glass windows and golden lines zigzagging between us. Beth was sad that day because her best friend Leanne was allowed down to the lake for the first time, and she was real worried she wouldn't come back. So I'd let her play tag with us, even though Tommy said girls couldn't run for crap. I was going to go slower and let her outrun me so she'd feel better. Beth proved us both wrong, beating us every time so fast we didn't even have to let her win, could barely keep up as she paced through the pews, hair flying out behind her as Jesus watched us from the cross above the door. When my dad came to pick me up, I asked him where Mom was, as she always came to get me on church days. Daddy said she was with Clara and Grandma, and when I asked why, he said he'd explain when we got home. 
We drove home in his pickup, and he let me choose the music the whole ride home. The house was empty when we arrived, followed by a low, sinking feeling in my back teeth I always got before a storm, even when the sky was clear. Dad sat me down on the porch and opened two beers, pouring half of one into the grass before handing it to me. I wondered absentmindedly if the beer would get the worms chewing on the soil drunk. I wondered if they'd be too drunk to get home. Dad explained that Lila had gone. I told him I knew, that she told me last week she was going away. Daddy started at that, shoulders jumping like a coyote backed in a corner. He smiled with tears in his eyes, sipping his beer. I'm not surprised. That girl always knew what was going to happen. Had your grandma's witchy ways about her. He grinned, shaking his head and brushing a stray tear away with his thumb knuckle. Daddy opened his second beer as he explained that Lila's name got pulled and she wasn't going somewhere you can come back from. Boys don't cry, even when it hurts. Daddy always taught me that, but he had cried too, so I thought maybe this time it was allowed as I put my head in my hands. Daddy put a hand on my shoulder and let me cry it out as the moon slid slowly out from behind the blacktops, until I felt the whole sky would fill up with all that grief stacked up on our shoulders. It was two summers after Lila had gone. I was 14 and started high school. Me and Tommy had decided to shave our heads and start lifting weights my uncles let us borrow, determined to be the hardest guys to walk the hallways when we got back. Beth had even done us matching tattoos on the backs of our shoulders with a bureau and her mama's sewing needle, matching crosses, bone turned holy before we'd fully begun. Gramps let me borrow his truck sometimes, and me and Tommy would drive to the McDonald's in the next town over because our town didn't have one. Sometimes we'd take the girls with us, impressed by four wheels and the promise of a milkshake, even though they intimidated us a little. Girls in our town were like wild animals. They could drink more than both of us combined, wore their skirts short enough that you didn't have to imagine that hard what was underneath. When they kissed, they were all teeth and hands. Beth and Leanne grew up fast. Leanne had her tongue pierced and liked to take boys under the bleachers when she got bored. Tommy was one of those boys. Came back to me with stories of belt loops and lip gloss stains. Beth said the girls in our town were ticking time bombs that had no idea when they were going to go off. Beth once kissed me in the back of my daddy's truck after I'd driven her home. In the winter, when snow had turned the mountains into ghosts, she asked me to stay and have a smoke with her, said it made her lonely doing it by herself. She tasted red, like the cherry wine her older sisters gave her, and she undid her winter coat and put my hands inside her shirt. I could feel her heartbeat through my palms. When her hand moved down to the zipper on my Levi's, I pushed her away, gently, remembering Lila's warning. She cried then, and I'd held her, fourteen and unsure what to do, but kiss her forehead, do her coat back up. She told me if she was still here when we graduated, she was going to love me forever. It was the night before the last Sunday of summer. The sun had all gone from the sky, leaving town in a hurry. I'd gone to bed early that night, a low sinking feeling in the back of my teeth like the ones I'd get before watching a game our football team would eventually lose. Outside the windows, I heard the coyotes start to sing, weaving their voices with the night birds high up in the trees. I could hear the TV on downstairs, drifting upstairs like muffled waves. I dreamt about Lila, running through the purple sky, hair streaming out behind her. I'd had this dream many times before, and each time I ran after her, she'd be too fast, leaving me behind. But this time she turned around and stretched her arms wide out towards me. Her voice was slow, like she was talking through a wall, lagging in time. Swim, Wren. You have to swim, she said, eyes wide as she pointed behind me. I turned as a wall of lake water rushed at me, pulling me under into the deep. I woke up sweating, sheets a tangled mess beneath my back. The sky outside was turning blue, 
streaked up with gold like God spilled something across it. I could hear my heart banging so loud it sounded like it was coming from every direction. There was a wetness between my legs I could feel on the insides of my thighs. I yanked the sheets back and my hand came back red and sticky with blood. I yelled for my mama, convinced I was dying, organs bleeding out through my stomach. My heartbeat was so loud I held my head in my hands. Mom ran into my room. She saw the blood on my hands and collapsed on the ground, knees bending like she was about to pray. Jesus, forgive us, she started to cry. I saw Daddy grab his gun from under the bed and stand at the top of the stairs. Please forgive us. They're coming, Lorna. Not a thing we can do. He turned to look at me over his shoulder, and something like the seven stages of grief passed over his face faster than I could keep up with. Ren, I'm so sorry. We thought we could save you. The banging was now so loud it was shaking the walls, and as the front door was kicked in, I realized it wasn't my heart at all, but the sounds of fists on the walls of our house. Gramps ran up the stairs, followed by Grandma, who was clawing at his arms, wild, trying to hold him back. He pushed her aside. He looked down the barrel of my daddy's gun and Dad handed it over silently, turning away with his eyes closed as Mom screamed at him. Mom jumped from the floor and stood in front of me like she was shielding me. Step aside, Lorna. Mom shook her head. Gramps stepped towards her, pointing the gun. Don't think I won't. It's the way things have always been and the way they always must be. Step aside. Mama? I stood, hand on her shoulder, and gently pushed her aside to face my grandfather. This was the same man who taught me to drive, the man who gave me my first beer, the man who sat up with me all night during thunderstorms when I was little, sitting under the kitchen table with me as I cowered and telling me it was just God moving his furniture and there was nothing to be afraid of, the same man who now was pointing a gun toward the center of my chest. He was crying, I realized, which scared me even more. I'd never even heard of my gramps crying, not on, not on his wedding day, not even when Lila went away. He gritted his teeth and held out a hand towards me. You best come with me, Ren. So I did. We drove to the lake in silence. In the glare of the taillights, I could pick out Daddy's truck following behind. I studied my gramps, watched his hands on the wheel, the button on his shirt that he'd missed, obviously dressing in a hurry. I had nothing left to say to him, so I didn't. When we got to the water, most of the town was already there, lined up along the lakeside. All the girls were dressed in white with flowers in their hair. Gramps opened the door. He hesitated and tugged the rosary down from where it hung on the rearview mirror and placed it around my neck. He walked me out to the water and everybody stared in eerie silence. It was as if the people in town moved as one. The closer I looked, all of their chests rising and falling at the same time as they slowly raised their left hands to point at me from the crescent they made around the lakeside. Gramps turned to Mama, who had come up behind us, held up by Dad as she cried, grief trying to pull her bones to the ground. Please, Lorna, please don't make this worse than it needs to be. Ren deserves that at least. I saw Tommy and his Mama in the crowd. Both were blank-faced and pointing. Even when I caught Tommy's eyes, his Mama's wedding ring flashed on her finger, still there even after all these years. I felt a hand slowly slide into my own nodding our fingers together. Me and my mother walked into the lake together. The water was cool around my waist as we stood facing each other, me in my ratty t-shirt and her in her sweatpants. She smiled, bottom lip held fast by her teeth to stop the shaking as the tears kept coming. She held my face in her hands a moment, staring into the green of my eyes we both shared, same as Grandma, same as Lila. I had none of my daddy's brown-eyed ways about me, just that strange light green. Mama cradled me a moment in the water and dipped me low. The lake rushed over my head, cool green and soothing, like fingers running through my hair. I thought I could hear singing, soft and half-drowned sounds about apple trees and murdered lovers, and suddenly I understood everything about everyone in town. It was like the lights turning on after being born in the dark, terrifying and brilliant all at the same time. I knew why Tommy's daddy swam into the lake. I knew why Jonah drank at home alone on his twin-size mattress. 
I knew why Beth's parents had divorced when she was small. I knew what the preacher really did on Sunday nights at the strip club in the next town over. I knew why the girl that sat behind me in math had hidden scars all the way up both of her legs from ankle to hip bone. I knew that Lila had known she was going to die the last time I saw her. I knew every story and addiction and sin from the people that had raised me, the people I'd grown up with, every dirty thing behind every closed door, every unsung act of kindness and salvation, beatings and bruises and love, so much love, all wrapped up in hundreds of heartbeats from my neighbors and friends and the strangers I'd pass on the streets of our town every day. My head broke the surface of the water, and I knew what was really between my legs, that when my mama had felt that first kick in her stomach like all the women in our family, she had known what would happen, had felt that low pain in her back teeth that I would be born a girl, green-eyed and raised to be swallowed by the lake, so she and my daddy had made a decision to raise me safely, to protect me from the thing that kept our own town's blood flowing. I saw my whole life around me as I went under again. Every rule they'd made, every passing piece of advice that was carefully constructed to keep my reality intact, a secret my parents had carried around with them for 14 summers, but you can't hide from nature. I felt it then, the thing under the lake, older than anything up on the land, with our fragile bones and thin minds, our gods and our houses, somewhere deep within the water. I felt it calling me, tugging at my ribs and lungs. I started to wade out into the deeper water, the lake slowly rising up to my ribs. My mother made me when I grew inside her, and as I left my mother behind, I forgave her. I forgave my daddy for not fighting what was inevitable. I forgave my uncles and aunties, the people my little cousins would grow up to be. I forgave my gramps for the rage and the grief that had got the better of him. I forgave my grandma for not telling me sooner. I forgave everyone in the whole town standing up on the lakeside watching me go. All the terrible and beautiful things they would do and had done throughout their long little lives. The lake reached up to my jaw and started filling my mouth, cool against my tongue. I felt the trees shift in the dirt. I felt the chain-link fences in the backyards swaying felt the bends in the roads and the fruit as it grew. I felt everything and I knew everything. I heard Lila's voice calling from the other side through the mist. I imagined her red hair floating on the lake surface like blood or strange flowers. Swim, Ren. You gotta swim. And so I did. Coming up, it's a story written by one of our very own Weirdo family members. It's The Sandwich by Jim Stein when Weird Darkness returns. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. The Sandwich by Jim Stein The sandwich perched on the imitation wood countertop and glared at Doug with quiet malevolence. He understood the food's silence, but couldn't imagine why it should be angry, let alone how it could display emotions. He'd ordered pizza for lunch, 
but when the bell rang, found this surly sandwich waiting on his front stoop. Hey, hello? came a male voice. Doug's attention jerked back to the phone. This is Doug on 31st Street. I ordered a pepperoni pizza about an hour ago, but you guys delivered what looks like a stacked club, and there's something wrong with it. Hang on. Doug Golfner, right? You're in the computer, but we haven't gotten any orders today. Did you maybe call the Freedom City store by accident? Sudden doubt washed over him. I suppose it's possible, but both numbers are on your flyer, but I still want my pizza and to get this goofy sandwich out of my house. Sorry, nothing I can do from here. Give the other number a call. I'm sure they'll straighten it out. Okay, but tell me something. Doug glanced up at the turkey and ham club on his kitchen table. Wisps of lettuce protruded from beneath its weedy brow, the ends of two rolled ham slices forming the disturbing likeness of eyes that blazed with accusation. Hadn't the thing been on the counter a second ago? What, sir? Doug edged away from the table, cupped a hand around the phone, and spoke softly. Yeah, um, do, do you guys do anything special to your sandwiches? I don't know, something different? Sir, we got lots of special sandwiches, a different one for each day of the week. Someone shouted in the background on the other end. Take a look at the flyer. Uh, I gotta get to the other line. D do you need the Freedom number? Doug let out the breath that he'd been holding. <sighs> no thanks. I've got it here. Unfortunately, the Freedom City Pizza Shop didn't have any better idea of how the sandwich had come to be on the front step. I'm not going crazy. I ordered from a guy that talked slow and heavy. He took my credit card number and everything. The sandwich looked on placidly without comment. Doug felt it should go into the fridge before bacteria began to grow, but he was loath to touch the thing for fear its malevolence would somehow contaminate him. Who sent you? He couldn't think of anyone that would pull such a stupid prank. It had been months since he parted ways with his last employer, Reliable Courier. He hadn't clicked with anybody in the office enough to be the butt of one of their jokes, and so far, Sunshine Foods' night shift proved ideal. It was the perfect arrangement with no one to bother him. Who sent you, sandwich man? Doug surprised himself by asking the question so loudly. A low hum tickled his ear. Though nearly inaudible, it set his nerves on edge. What if the sandwich knew? <laughs> An absurd thought. But Doug couldn't think of any other reasonable explanation. Listen, it wasn't anything personal, just things get out of hand sometimes, you know? But the club sandwich didn't know. Or if it did, it wasn't tipping its hand. At some point, they moved to the living room. Doug sat in a burnt orange chair opposite the ottoman that supported his antagonist. Two green olives had worked their way forward within the ham spirals, emphasizing the thing's disapproval. Doug felt compelled to explain. Society's to blame, Sandy. He bit back a high-pitched giggle. Society was a sham. People being oh so polite, saying, please and excuse me. None of them really meant it. You could tell by the way everybody drove, how they talked behind your back. The sandwich could be as angry as it liked. It was definitely wrong on this one. At least you got the guts to confront me face to face. Those other hypocrites wouldn't dare. They just whisper behind your back, make the boss think you're nuts or something. Me? Crazy? Doug giggled again. <laughs> they don't say that anymore. I've been putting a stop to it. The discussion made the sandwich nervous, an uncharacteristic change in attitude. The olives retreated, and hollow ham rolls darted covert glances at the hand Doug slid down to his side. What? Doug purred as his left hand stroked a wooden handle protruding from the seat cushion. Oh, this? He drew the chef's knife out and studied his reflection in the stainless steel. Sometimes you gotta take a stand, Sandy. If you don't, they'll walk all over you, even get you fired. I've almost stopped the lies. One last guest tonight. He sighed, eyes following the thin trails of crumbs leading from the center of the ottoman to where the wheat crust hung off the back edge, feeling for a surface that wasn't there. The ham spirals held an entirely different expression. It could have been fear, but Doug liked to think of it as respect. I do appreciate your candor. He looked up from the blade, 
but I can't accept your criticism. It's nothing personal. The flashing knife wiped the disapproving smirk from the club's face. Again and again it fell, dicing the hapless entree into tiny cubes. Doug scooped the chunks onto a paper plate and dumped them down the laundry chute. They tumbled a few feet and landed on a pile of refuse in a corner of the basement. A jumble of stark white shapes shone in the dim light leaking through the tiny basement windows. The sandwich cubes rolled to rest among a pile of bones. Bones scraped clean and sprayed with bleach. If the remnants of the erstwhile lunch plate had possessed a rudimentary forensic knowledge, it might have concluded that the oldest remains had been here only a few weeks. As it was, the sandwich could do no more than bemoan its predicament, which was at odds with a vague sense of rightness and reunion. While the sandwich tried to sort out its feelings, the doorbell rang. Doug tucked the slashed ottoman into a closet and ushered in a blue-haired woman that he'd had the misfortune of working with as a package courier. He set the old woman up with a drink and spoke from the kitchen as he prepared their meal. Meg, I hope you don't mind homemade hoagies. Sunshine Foods gives me a great employee discount. Fine with me, Meg slurred, making him smile. So you're getting along all right at the new job? Yes, indeed. It's the late shift, so no one to bother you. No games, just honest work. I'll make sure the machinery doesn't get gummed up. Keep the meat hoppers full, check a few gauges, and watch the deli meat roll out. It's great. Meg sighed in relief and downed another swallow. She'd complained as much as anyone about Doug's strange habits and lost packages. At least the boy didn't hold a grudge. She settled back in the oddly colored cushions and used her swizzle stick to chase an ice cube around her faded Flintstones glass. Her eyelids drooped as she listened to Doug hum in the other room. Hopefully she wouldn't drift off while he made dinner. That would be inexcusably rude. She sat up and tried to concentrate as her host added words to the familiar melody. Doug's knife slid through a head of lettuce, keeping rhythm as he sang in a beautiful tenor. My baloney has a first name. I have one more epic story to share with you. It's The Rental by Christopher Maxim, and it's coming up next on Weird Darkness. When Salem Roanoke took a job near his family's new home as a hired hand in the Texas Hill Country, he anticipated learning the rancher's trade, but a series of strange events, shocking murders, and unholy revelations divert him down another path. This terrifying trajectory puts him directly into the middle of a struggle between monsters, magic, and men. Armed and backed by a militia of ranchers, Salem attempts to combat the creeping tide of evil that threatens to engulf his new home and destroy the people most important to him. Will Salem manage to save his home, or have his actions condemn everyone he hopes to save? The Witch Trials – A Summer of Wolves and Season of the Witch by S. R. Roanoke Available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions. Look for The Witch Trials by S. R. Roanoke on Amazon or find it on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. I stood still for a moment, awestruck. The pictures didn't do it justice. It was a large but quaint home, located on a secluded island near Cape Cod. A small piece of land void of life, only the cottage and a lighthouse visible across the water. Verified as an Airbnb Plus rental, one week's rent came to a little over $3,000. The price was steep, but completely worth it. This would be the best place to clear my head and finish writing my novel. 
I happily trotted across the stone walkway to the front door and grabbed the knob, ready to map out the rest of my book. It would be my second release. My publisher had been breathing down my neck for months, constantly asking for updates. Now I had the perfect environment to complete it. Upon opening the door, I was caught off guard. Hello? I nearly jumped out of my skin. There was a man inside. Late fifties? Average build? Gray mustache? It took me a moment to match the face to the one on his superhost profile. It was Garrett, the owner of the property. Sorry, Garrett, you startled me. I didn't expect anyone to be here. He smiled. I greet all of my guests. You people are my livelihood, after all. Please, come in. We have some important matters to discuss. I joined him in the living room. We sat in armchairs on opposite sides of a long coffee table. Garrett simply continued to smile. So what did you want to discuss? I asked. He pulled out a folded sheet of paper out from his jacket and slid it across the coffee table. It stopped in front of me. I picked it up for a closer look. The edges were worn, and it felt almost canvas-like between my fingers. I began unfolding, but Garrett stopped me. Don't! You'll have plenty of time for that later. Just listen. I looked up at him, confused but compliant. This house has been in my family for generations. Staying here can be a rewarding experience, but it can also be a dreadful one if you're not careful. Come on, Garrett. Don't tell me the place is haunted. I was the one smiling now. Garrett looked at me thoroughly unamused. My smile vanished and I gestured for him to continue. On that sheet of paper are some rules. You must follow every last one of them. There are no exceptions. So long as you do this, your vacation will be a pleasant one. With that, Garrett stood up from the chair and walked to the front door. He turned to me on his way out and offered a final sentiment before leaving. Follow the rules, Jack. If you don't, you're in for a bumpy ride. When he left, I unfolded the list, expecting to see a reiteration of his stay requirements. No pets, no modifications, clean up after yourself, that sort of thing. This was not the case. On the paper was a set of rules that only served to bookend our strange encounter with further confusion. Number one, no lights on past 11.25 p.m. Number two, do not answer your phone. Callers cannot be trusted. Number three, only two people are permitted inside, Hank Penston and Jessica Covenwood. Ask for last names. Number four, do not exit the house after midnight until sunrise. Number five, if your room changes location, close the door and try again. Only leave when connection has been reestablished. Number six, the voices are harmless, do not converse with them. Number seven, never lock the doors. Number eight, if you have any trouble, call Jessica Covenwood at this number and then there's the phone number. This is the only phone call you can trust. This lifeline may only be used once during your rental period. At the bottom of the page was a final note. I will come to collect you, but only when the rental period is over, not a moment sooner. There is no leaving until then. As I sat there mulling over the list, it all became clear. Garrett was a lunatic. Either that or this was a poor attempt at humor. Either way, I brushed off our meeting and the list of rules altogether, placing the paper on the coffee table where it stayed for the rest of the night. A majority of the first night was peaceful. Of my novel's final six chapters that needed completing, I was able to stay up late and finish two of them. First drafts, at least. There was still a lot left to do. My final days on the island would have to be spent proofreading the entire manuscript and filling cracks in the narrative before sending it to my editor. Still, two chapters was not a bad night's work, all things considered. After patting myself on the back for a job well done, I looked at my phone. It was 12.18 a.m. My lips spread into a slight smile as I looked at the desk light, wavering in and out of life. It's past 11.25, Garrett. Was this why I needed to turn off the lights so they wouldn't flicker? 
I chuckled to myself as another rule came to mind. Number four, if I remembered correctly, do not exit the house after midnight. I continued to laugh to myself as I ventured downstairs, opened the front door, and stepped out into the night. The view was brilliant, a blanket of stars covering the cape, only broken up by the gorgeous lighthouse jutting upward, practically cutting a hole in the night sky. It was a breathtaking sight, well worth the partial advance for my book. What's the reasoning behind this rule, Garrett? You didn't want me to enjoy the view? I turned and stepped back into the house. I then locked the door. <laughs> Oops, that's another rule broken. Hope the house doesn't chastise me. With that, I traveled upstairs to the bedroom and fell into a blissful sleep the moment my body met the sheets. My slumber would not last. 3.27 a.m. I awoke to a thunderous banging at the front door. In a groggy slur of motion, my legs just barely managed to pull the rest of my body out of bed. Practically sleepwalking, I eventually made my way downstairs and opened the door. Outside, there were no longer any stars. Their light was replaced with a thick fog rolling over the ocean. The water and air were still, frozen in place. There was no one there but me. I closed the door and went back to bed, certain that the sounds I heard were remnants of a dream overlapping with waking life. My body fell onto the bed and sleep took hold once more. 4.42 a.m. I awoke again, ripped from a dream state where I was turning in my novel to the publishing house. For whatever reason in this dream, Garrett was my boss. He held the manuscript to my face and flipped the pages, revealing a lack of ink. There's nothing here, Jack. All that time and nothing to show for it. He continued to flip through before stopping somewhere in the middle. Unlike the other pages, this one had text. The words were familiar, but they weren't written by me. Garrett's rules painted the page, the pitch black ink slowly dripping from the paper. His form soon followed, melting onto the floor below. You should have followed the rules, Jack. That's when I sprung to life, my heart pounding as I sat up in bed. The sound of pages turning rang in my ears, but it hadn't leaked over from my nightmare. Over on the desk was my manuscript, its paper wildly flapping about. My heart nearly sank before I noticed a chill in the room. I'd left the window open. It was just the wind. Relieved, I shut the window and went back to sleep. 5.19 a.m. No sound woke me this time. Instead, it was nature calling, beckoning me to take a late-night trip to the bathroom. Unfortunately for me, this would not be an easy task. Upon opening the bedroom door, I was greeted by a deeply unsettling sight. It was a hallway. Not the hall that should have been there, mind you, an entirely different hallway. Noticeably different. It was narrow, almost too thin for a person to walk through. And it was long, very long, seemingly longer than the building itself. Lining the sides was a plethora of doors, more doors than I knew the house to have. It was by all means unexplainable. I rubbed my eyes to test their acuity. The hallway was still there. I wondered for a moment if I was dreaming, but quickly discarded the notion certain that I could tell the difference between what was real and what wasn't. But if not a dream, then what? With an air of hesitance about me, my feet pattered into the narrow void. I tried each door along the way, but they were all locked. Halfway in, a harrowing sound cut through the air. I turned my head to see that the bedroom door had shut itself. Running back and turning the knob was futile. It wouldn't budge. Without a whole lot of options, I continued down the hall. At the end was a final door, different than the rest. Affixed to it was a plaque with a designation, like one you might see in a hotel. According to the text, it was room 371. The knob offered no resistance as I turned it and gently pushed the door open. There was no light inside. Still, I could make out something standing in the center of the room, facing me. It was a shadowy figure, slightly darker than the blackness around it. A vague glow outlined its form. It was tall, taller than any man. 
I had the inclination to close the door and turn back, but fear kept me anchored in place. My breathing became erratic, and my heart rate soared to new heights as it took a step towards me. In a flash, it lunged to my position. Everything went black. My eyes opened to sunlight pouring into the room. I was back in bed. This was strange. Every bone in my body told me it wasn't a dream, but rational thinking dictated otherwise. I had no choice but to entertain the idea that I was having vivid night terrors in the face of a fast-approaching publishing deadline. The sooner I finished the book, I thought, the sooner they would vanish. Though it didn't sit well with me. It was the only explanation I had. My phone buzzed on the bedside table. I knew who it was, but with my deadline on the horizon, I couldn't afford the distraction. When the buzzing ceased, I crawled out of bed and started the day. My first few hours awake were productive. I was able to write over half of the next chapter and tweak some finer details throughout the rest of the book. My progress was, however, impeded by a knock at the front door. Unlike the night previous, there was someone out there. A man. "'Can I help you?' I asked, confused. "'Was hoping I could help you, actually. The name's Hank. I'm a locksmith from the mainland. Garrett sent me to check the locks on all the doors.' I pondered for a moment and then grabbed the list of rules from the coffee table. I looked it over before meeting Hank back at the door. "'Well, it looks like you're on the list. Splendid. May I come in, then?' An unnaturally wide smile danced across his cheeks. "'Yeah, sure, come in.' Hank walked past the threshold and sighed. There was a long moment of silence before he spoke again. "'What a lovely place. Can't wait to sink my teeth in and get to work.' He then sauntered off upstairs. I sat down on the couch and continued writing, hoping my creative breakthrough hadn't subsided. An hour passed. Then another. I was able to finish up some more work, but something kept scratching at the back of my mind. I knew locksmithing wasn't the loudest job out there, but I expected to hear at least some sort of tinkering coming from upstairs. The distant sound of keys scraping against the lock's inner chambers? But no, there was only silence. I then wondered why Hank was there to begin with. This was far from a typical rental experience, especially one on a secluded island. I skimmed the list again. Two things stood out. Rule number seven, never lock the doors. Even if Garrett was deranged, it was clear he didn't want the doors locked, so why then would he send a locksmith? Who would be breaking in out here anyway? The second thing that jumped out at me was the end of rule number three, ask for last names. Something wasn't adding up, but I intended to get to the bottom of it. Hank! I yelled out, hoping to get his attention. There was no answer. Hank! Can you please come down here? No response. Only silence. This was my cue to investigate. To my dismay, the second floor was completely vacant. I scoured every room, every nook and cranny the house had to offer, to no avail. Hank was nowhere to be found. I couldn't make heads or tails of it. How could a person just up and vanish like that? I returned to the first floor. Hank was there, sitting on the couch, looking over my manuscript. There was no way he could have snuck by me. Say, this is pretty good. I wonder how it's going to play out. Help me out here, Jack. Is there a happy ending, or does the man succumb to his own demons? I stood frozen at the bottom of the stairs. Hank, I asked, what's your last name? A grin formed beneath his nose. Redden. The name is Hank Redden. Why do you ask? I looked down at the list in my hand. Penston. His name was supposed to be Hank Penston. No reason, just curious. Hey, do you mind tossing me my phone? Hank looked down at my phone on the coffee table. A few moments passed before he grabbed it and looked over at me. He stared for a long time, almost as if calculating the distance, and then finally threw it over. I caught it and ran for the front door. Thanks, I'll be right back. I sprinted to the edge of the island, unsure of who or what was inside the house. 
it was becoming ever apparent that Garrett might not be so crazy after all. Something truly strange was afoot, and I wanted no part of it. At first, I called the ferry station. No answer. Then Garrett. Still no answer. Before I could try another number, my ex-wife called. I'd been ignoring her call for weeks. Charlotte, thank God. I'm at an Airbnb off the Cape. I need you to... She interjected. Leslie's dead, Jack. My blood ran cold. It was said with the same tone and resentment as it was two years before. All at once, the floodgates opened and a slew of memories poured in, ones I had tried desperately to repress. Leslie was our daughter. Before Charlotte and I divorced, she was struck by a car on her way home from school. Charlotte was at work, and I was supposed to pick Leslie up, but I was too wrapped up in my first novel. I forgot all about her, my own daughter. She walked a good mile before the collision. I never forgave myself. Neither did Charlotte. Charlotte, why are you saying this? Tears rolled down my face. She's dead, Jack. It's your fault. My baby is dead all because of you. The voice became louder and less distinct until I could barely recognize the cadence. An inhuman growl. You're to blame, Jack. You belong where you are. I hope you rot in that house. I looked down at the list, now stained with a steady stream of droplets dripping from my cheeks. And that's when I remembered rule number two. Do not answer your phone. Callers cannot be trusted. As much as it pained me, I hung up on her. It wasn't real, but it sure as hell felt like it was. I wiped away my tears and looked at the last rule. Braving the fierce currents of the ocean likely wouldn't end well. The shore, nearly 16 miles away, so Jessica was my only hope. The only phone call you can trust, according to Garrett. I dialed the number and waited. After two tones, my ear was met with a female voice. You broke a rule, didn't you? Uh, a few, actually, give or take. She let out a sigh. Did you let anyone in? Yes, Hank. Hank Penston? No, Hank Redden. There was another disappointed sigh. Okay, listen carefully. I want you to go to the back of the house, but act natural. No sudden moves or conspicuous behavior. Any slight change in your attitude could set him off. Walk slow and be cautious. Okay. I did as instructed. On my way around the house, I looked through the window. Hank was no longer in the living room. There was a slight spike in my adrenaline, but I held my composure. Until turning the corner, that is. Standing in the back of the house waiting for me was Hank. Hey there, Jack. What are you up to? Jessica chimed in. Stay calm and repeat what I say verbatim. Hank, I have Garrett on the phone. He wants to know if you can check the lock on the front door. He says it's been sticking lately. In the most casual voice I could muster, I repeated what Jessica said. Hank bore a stoic expression for a few moments and then spoke. That darn thing, I'll see what I can do. He walked past me and went off to the front of the house. I was officially rattled. Jessica's voice broke the tension. About a dozen yards from the house is an electrical box. Do you see it? I surveyed the area and noticed the box. It was embedded in a tree stump of all places, one that stuck out of the ground at an awkward angle. Yes, I see it. Good open the hatch. There's a lever there. I want you to pull it down and then wait exactly 10 seconds, after which you will place it back in its original position and close the hatch. I was confused. How is this going to help exactly? It was a third sigh of frustration. That is the master switch. When you pull the lever, it will deactivate all energy on the island. When you reset the lever, the house will reconstitute. This will wipe the slate clean. I didn't understand how it all worked, but I'd heard enough to warrant an obvious follow-up question. Couldn't I just leave it off? There was no sigh this time, just anger. No! The island is far worse when the energies are at bay. Ten seconds is all you're allowed. At this point, I saw Hank walking alongside the house. 
I fixed that lock for you, Jack. Jessica must have heard because her voice adopted a tone of urgency. Pull the lever now! I did as she said and began counting. Hank continued to walk towards me, his form phasing in and out like a bad television signal. Jack, what are, what are you doing? Need a hand? His pace grew faster until his walk became a run. My heart was pounding. Just as he was closing in, the ten seconds were up and I forced the lever back. Hank vanished completely, and the stump receded into the earth below. I fell back onto the ground in relief. Jessica, we did it. Click. Clearly she wasn't as pleased with the victory as I was. That was fine. I was just thankful to be alive. Once inside the house, I laid down in bed and held the list to my face, scrutinizing every last detail. I was determined not to break another rule for the rest of my stay. That night was peaceful. I made sure all of the doors were unlocked, turned off the lights by 11.25, and refused to answer any calls. When I slept, there were no strange dreams. No dreams at all, in fact. It was a truly restful night. The best sleep I had had in years. Despite my predicament, I awoke hopeful. Hopeful that I could weather the storm and survive the week. I was even able to write some more of my book. Not much, but enough to jumpstart my creativity. The next night didn't go nearly as well. 2.12 a.m. I had woken without cause. In an effort to fall back asleep, I shut my eyes and allowed my mind to wander. I thought of my book and the deadline. I thought of my eventual departure from the island. Before long, I thought of Charlotte and Leslie. The image of our once happy family would forever be seared into my broken heart. I felt my eyes begin to water. But something interrupted the sadness. A sound. Footsteps. My eyes opened and I sprang to life, sitting upright in bed. The footsteps stopped just outside the room. With a great deal of apprehension, I got out of bed, took a deep breath, and tiptoed to the door. When I turned the knob and opened it, I found myself at the entrance of the house. With rule number five in mind, I shut the door and opened it again. I was now at the living room. Next was the bathroom. Then a hallway. A familiar hallway. Off in the distance, I hear the click of room 371's door. The tall shadow stepped out. The hall began to shrink. The figure closed the gap between us in a matter of seconds. Luckily, my will to live outweighed the fear that held me in place. I managed to shut the door just in time to prevent my demise. When I opened it again, the room was back where it was supposed to be. 3.47 a.m just as I was finally drifting back to sleep, the voices started. Hey, Jack, enjoying your stay? Though frightened, rule number six came to mind, and I followed it. The voices were harmless, and I was not to converse with them. What's wrong, Jack? Hung up on Garrett's rules? That's no fun. I closed my eyes as the voice grew louder and hid beneath the covers. Don't hide, Jack. We won't hurt you. Honest. The footsteps were back, walking outside the room. They stopped at the door. He's here now, Jack. I can tell you how to make him go away. But you have to talk to me. The door creaked open, and the footsteps recommenced, walking over to the side of my bed. He's leaning over you now. I can make him leave. Just say a word. I couldn't give in to the ploy. I had to obey the rules, but then there was a tug on the sheets. My heart nearly stopped. Wake up, Jack! I jolted to a sitting position. The room was empty and the door shut. It was a dream. But that didn't explain the hand-shaped impression on the edge of the bed. No matter the culprit, I would endure the torment. It was only a week. You can get through this, Jack. Leslie's face flashed in my mind and forced an unexpected tear out. You've been through so much worse. The next few nights came and went without issue. 
There were some dicey moments, but I learned to handle the odd voice here and there, and the room moving every now and again. I ignored knocks at the front door altogether, avoiding any and all potential repeats of the Hank incident. Night six, however, was by far the worst. Some things never change. Dark clouds loomed over the ocean as waves crashed into the island, just like the night Leslie was killed. I became deeply engrossed in my writing to the point that nothing in the world could have pulled me away. Even after everything that had happened in the house, I was somehow able to finish the book. Maybe the shock to my system inspired me. My fear had transformed into focus, granting me a greater mental clarity. When all was said and done and the editing complete, there was a horrible revelation. According to my phone, it was 11.24 p.m. My heart sank to the depths of my soul as I raced across the house, shutting lights off, knocking over furniture and decorations in the process. When I came back to the bedroom to turn off the final light at the desk, I glanced at my phone once more. The readout is now etched in my memory. 11.26 p.m. I clicked off the light, praying that my phone's readout was somehow wrong and that I still had time. 11.27 p.m. The bedroom door slammed itself shut behind me. I jostled the knob and pushed my weight against it, but it remained unmoved. A swirling black vortex of smoke was expelled from beneath the bed. It covered the floor in an instant and began rising to fill the rest of the room. I had no intention of waiting to see what would happen to me in the darkness, so I flung myself at the window and shattered the glass, landing on my back in a bed of shrubbery below. The impact knocked the wind out of me. Shortly thereafter, I passed out. 11.38 p.m. I dreamt. I know it was a dream and not the house's doing because it was one that I'd had many times before. The setting, my daughter's school. The bell rang and a stampede of children rushed out into the world, excited to leave for the day and see their parents. The last person out was Leslie, left alone to her own devices. Daddy, where are you? Her eyes darted back and forth. I tried to call out to her, but much like the day in question, I wasn't there. In the dream, I was only an observer, forced to watch as the horror unfolded before me. Leslie waited for fifteen long minutes before heading off in the direction of our home. I bore witness to her trek, a poor girl alone in the cold. And then it happened. Dream tears flooded my field of view as a car swerved and the heart-wrenching scream of that beautiful young girl rang through the winter air. 11.56 p.m. I woke up on the ground, covered in tears and broken glass. The ocean waves crashed against the walls of the house. There was no time to waste. Without my phone, I didn't know exactly what time it was, but it had to be close to midnight. Another broken rule would only make matters worse. I raced to the front door, opened it, and swiftly shut it behind me, somewhat thankful to be back in the house but also somewhat terrified. The coming moments would echo the latter emotion, adding to my woes. 12.05 a.m. I was able to open the bedroom door and retrieve my phone. Luckily, the smoke had vanished. Upon venturing back down to the living room, I was shattered, just like the glass on the ground outside. There, sitting on the couch where Hank sat before her, was Leslie. My Leslie. I reached the bottom step and nearly fell to my knees, almost forgetting to breathe in the process. She was the same, exactly the same, every feature identical to the day I last saw her. How is this possible? Hi, Daddy. Her voice pulled a wave of emotion out of me, stronger than anything I had ever felt before. Was it really her? Was this really my precious Leslie, brought back to life? Surely th this wasn't the house's doing, was it? Sweetheart, is that you? Is it really you? She looked over at me with innocent eyes. Yes, Daddy, it's me. I ran over to her and took her in my arms, my face now drenched in an ocean of tears. 
Oh, Leslie, sweetheart, I missed you so much. I pulled away to get a better look at her. That's when I saw it. For an instant, in between blinks, her eyes were solid pools of black. This was not my Leslie. I backed away at once. What's wrong, Daddy? I continued my retreat to the stairs. You're not real. This isn't real. We buried you. Her next words stopped me in my tracks. No, Daddy. You buried me. Her eyes locked with mine as I cried. You killed me. You're the reason I'm dead. I took a pained breath before responding. You're right. I was a terrible father and I deserve every moment of torture this house puts me through. If I ever get out of here, I'm, I'm going to visit your grave for the first time and tell you how sorry I am and how much I have missed you over the years. Not a day goes by that the guilt doesn't eat me up inside. I swallowed the lump in my throat and wiped away the tears as she looked up at me, her head tilted in observation. But, but you you are not her. I ran up those stairs as fast as I could. Leslie's piercing screams echoed through the house, followed by a sound of every window breaking in reaction to the pitch. Once in the bedroom, I closed the door behind me and slid down in a sitting position on the floor against it, utterly defeated and emotionally drained. I pulled out my phone and dialed Jessica's number. After two tones, she picked up. What is it this time? Don't tell me you broke another rule. I, th I think I'm going to die tonight, Jessica. Her perturbed tone vanished, replaced with concern. Jack? What did you do? What's going on over there? I can't fight it anymore. It it's too much. As much as I wanted to live, I could feel myself giving up. I don't even know why I called her. She couldn't help. The lever was gone, and it was past midnight. The storm outside was destroying the house. Soon, I would be swept out to sea, never to be heard from again. Hold on, Jack. I'll be there soon. Click. She wouldn't be coming. Even if the fairies ran that late, they wouldn't dare operate in a storm this violent. The end was near, and I could feel it. Coming up, it's the conclusion of our story, The Rental, by Christopher Maxim on Weird Darkness. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. One thirteen a.m. After a good long while of wallowing in self-pity, there was a knock at the front door. Jessica? No, it couldn't be. I cautiously exited the bedroom and slowly descended the staircase to the living room below. The storm raged on outside, a gust of wind howling through the house. In reaching the bottom step, I noticed that the coast was clear. Leslie's ghost was nowhere in sight. 
as quickly as I could without drawing any unwanted attention to myself. I pattered over to the door and opened it. Behind it was a beautiful woman in her thirties, black hair, peach skin, and a tasteful spattering of freckles on either side of her nose. Jessica? I asked. Who else would it be? Her voice and sassy attitude answered my question in spades. I stepped aside and she barged in, clearly upset. I closed the door behind her, careful not to lock it and risk breaking another rule. I was less scared of the supernatural consequences than I was of Jessica's fury. You really had me worried, Jack. What did you do, anyway? Before I could answer, a small figure appeared from behind the couch. It was Leslie. Jessica followed my gaze and looked across the room. Jack? Who's that? My daughter. I didn't know she was here with you. You don't understand. My daughter has been dead for two years. Jessica backed up to the door where I was still standing. Oh, I see. Just as before, Leslie let out an awful shriek that rang through the house. It was louder than before, much louder. Jessica turned to me, our hands cupping our ears. Jack, we need to get out of here. Follow me. We raced past Leslie and up the stairs to the bedroom. Okay, Jack, let's get going. She shut the door and opened it. She continued this routine, revealing the many rooms of the house. At one point, it opened up into the living room. Jessica quickly slammed it shut before Leslie could make her way in to get us. Finally, it opened up into the hallway. Yes, that hallway. Jessica grabbed my wrist. Come on, let's go. I yanked my arm back in refusal. Are you insane? I've been in there. I don't plan on going back. Have you seen room 371? Jessica let out one of her signature sighs. Yes, I know all about it. So long as we get to where we're going before the shadow notices, we'll be fine. Now come on, we don't have a lot of time here. I reluctantly respected her wishes. I wasn't keen on facing that ominous stretch of hall again, but Jessica's advice hadn't failed me yet. Besides, I was ready to die just an hour ago. Whatever fate would befall me in there couldn't be any worse than seeing my dead daughter resurrected. Okay, Jessica, I'm ready. 1.36 a.m. Matching each other's pace, step for step, we disappeared into the dark hallway, the bedroom door closing behind us. I whispered so as not to wake the beast. Where are we going, anyway? None of the doors down here open. Without hesitation, she answered. One does. It took a moment for it to sink in. No, Jessica, are you serious? I can't go in that room. It lives in there. She turned to me and put her hands on either side of my face. She stared into my eyes with a look of pure kindness. I was taken aback by the unexpected intimacy. Jack, you need to calm down. Just trust me. We're going to be fine, I promise. As far as explanations go, that was pretty vague. Still, it was reassuring. I can't explain it, but I was compelled to believe her. There was something about Jessica I really liked a warmth that radiated around her, a contagious, soothing force. We continued down the hall, and I didn't bring up my reservations again. 1.42 a.m. We reached the door. This was it, the moment of truth. I was about to open it when Jessica pulled my hand back. In order for this to work, you need to knock three times, no more and no less. I nodded in agreement. I raised my hand to the wood and knocked precisely three times. A deep anxiety racked my nerves as the anticipation grew. After a few moments, the door was pulled open, revealing the shadowy figure within. It stepped away and motioned for us to enter. I looked over to Jessica for approval. She nodded and followed me in. The entity softly closed the door behind us. It then walked over to where we stood and changed it its dark form turned to light, illuminating the rest of the room. It was the bedroom, only it wasn't exactly the same. Something was amiss. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, it just felt different. The bright figure then shrunk down to a glowing orb and drifted away, phasing through one of the walls, leaving us by ourselves. Moonlight shone through the window. 
The glass wasn't broken anymore. There was no storm outside. Everything was pristine. Je Jessica, what just happened? This is the house's safe place. A failsafe for when too many rules are broken. She could tell I wasn't following. It's a copy of the bedroom from just before things went south. A moment suspended in time that we can stay in for a while. At dawn, everything will revert to normal. Why didn't you tell me about it before? Honestly, it's a risky move. The shadow is a fickle being. When you enter room 371, there's only a 50% chance he'll accept your entrance. Otherwise, you're doomed. I couldn't believe it. You're telling me we could have died? You risked our lives on a 50% chance? She came over and placed her hands on my face again. Jack, we're safe. There's no need to be angry. Relax. We would have died anyway at the hands of the house. This was our only option. She was right. Honestly, I was happy she was there. Without her, I would have been a goner. 3.17 a.m. Jessica spent some time going over my manuscript. I filled in some of the blanks so she could skip the more fatty sections and finish before bed. Jack, this is beautiful. I wasn't so sure. Maybe I put too much of myself in it. Maybe the blood I poured onto the pages covered up the meaning. Who in their right mind would want to swim through my despair to reach a story even I wasn't sure I believed in? It's about you, isn't it, Jack? This is your life from the moment your daughter died to now? I felt myself unraveling. I'm tired, Jessica. I, I think I'm going to call it a night. I offered her a half-smile, waltzed over to the bed, and laid down. To my surprise, she laid down with me and placed her hand on my chest. It's okay, Jack. I've never lost a child, so I can't imagine the kind of things you're dealing with. I do know that things will never be the same. That doesn't mean you have to give up. What would your daughter have wanted? There was no fighting the tears any longer. You, you don't understand, Jessica. I'm, res I'm responsible. She... She was waiting for me when it happened. I was her father, and I wasn't there for her when she needed me. Jessica didn't respond. I sobbed until there was nothing left in me. When the moment passed, I asked her a question. Why do these things happen here? Honestly, I don't really know. We turned to each other. Her warmth reared its head again, inviting me to come to it. Our lips met, and with it, an intense feeling was born. Like nothing I'd ever felt, a somber, quiet energy filled the air and coated the room. In a turn of events I will never fully fathom, Jessica and I made love. 5.32 a.m. Jessica fell asleep in my arms. I stayed awake, content for the first time in years. Then a familiar disembodied voice burrowed into my ear and poisoned my mind. What you're feeling isn't real. By this point, I was all too familiar with the voices and their antics. I ignored its statement. She does this to every tenant. She's a seductress. I was tempted to reply, but conversing was forbidden. I couldn't afford a broken rule this close to the finish line. Only two people are allowed in, Jack. Two. It's a simple rule. What did that have to do with anything? What was the voice up to? Jessica was one of the two. Despite my unrest, I continued to bite my tongue. Always ask for last names. There was a moment of pause before the realization washed over me. I gasped. A rule had indeed been broken. I jumped and backed into the corner of the room. Jessica was standing next to the bed. I hadn't even seen her get up. Jack, are you okay? My breathing became labored. It was hard to construct my query in a normal fashion. Jessica, are you really you? Was this, 
What is your last name? The light left her face. Her now empty eyes cut right through me. I slid to the floor. A long period of silence passed before anything changed. Before she changed. 5.51 a.m. Jessica's face widened. Her eyes became large, as if physically engorged with bloodlust. She lunged at me. I dodged the attack and hit the door hard. I reached for the knob, but it wouldn't turn. Jessica's new form spoke. A gurgling, metallic sound that ricocheted off the walls. It looks like you're stuck with me, Jack. She lunged again. I slid under the bed to escape her reach. Her feet paced around its perimeter, a predator circling its prey. It was just a matter of time now. I closed my eyes and thought of Charlotte and Leslie playing in the snow, the last day I saw them together. This would be my final thought as death approached, as beautiful a thought as one could have before dying. At least now I could be with her again. A pained outcry from Jessica broke my concentration. The light in the room had changed. I rolled out from underneath the bed and saw her writhing in the corner. The sun was coming up over the horizon outside. This was my chance. I raced over to Jessica and clenched her neck. She struggled but was too weak to break free. I forced her against the window. Her skin melted, dripping like candle wax to the floor. Her hair burned to a crisp. I looked to her eyes for even a shred of humanity, something that might convince me to spare her for all she had meant to me. There was none, only malice. In that moment, I sincerely wished that she had been real. Goodbye, Jessica. With as much force as I could muster, I pushed her through the window. Her form disintegrated before it could reach the ground. The wind carried her ashes away into the endless expanse of the ocean. She was no more. The house was still. Hours passed. As my rental period came to a close, I sat in the living room and reflected on the events of the week. In a weird way, I had come to terms with Leslie's death. The guilt would always be there, but I felt I could move on now, free of the restraints that once bound me. Two knocks came at the door. I opened it and let Garrett in. Your fairy awaits. I nodded and gathered my things. I was anxious to leave, but felt the need to ask him something first. Garrett, what is this place? He smirked. Many words come to mind. Anomaly, portal, impossibility. I personally think it's a mirror, showing us ourselves in a way we never thought possible. A place where our past and present intersect. Perhaps the right word for it is closure. I smiled. You might be on to something, Garrett. Splendid. Does that mean you'll leave a good review? I chuckled. You know what? I'll do it right now. I opened the app and clicked through to the listing. A bit of information caught my eye as I scrolled. Checkout time? 12 p.m. I looked up at the readout at the top of my phone's display. It turned from 11.59 to 12 as I watched. I let someone in, before time was up, meaning a rule had just been broken. The note at the end of the list came to mind as the dread set in. I will come collect you, but only when the rental period is over, not a moment sooner. <sighs> that wasn't Garrett. I looked up to see him standing directly in front of me. Something wrong, Jack? I dropped my things and ran out to the dock as fast as I could. The ferry had just arrived, the real Garrett aboard, motioning for me to hurry. After boarding, I turned back and looked at the house one last time. The silhouette stood at the window, waving goodbye. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. 
WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on any of the sponsors you heard about during the show. Find all of my social media. Listen to audiobooks I've narrated. Sign up for the email newsletter. Find other podcasts that I host, including Retro Radio, Old Time Radio in the Dark, Church of the Undead, and a classic 1950s sci-fi style podcast called Auditory Anthology. Also on the site, you can visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, mugs, and other merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories on Thriller Thursday episodes are works of fiction, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes. The Hool and The Milk Boy were both written by Scott Donnelly, and you can find another of his books, Of a Mad Brain, on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. My Father Punished Me When I Talked to Ghosts is by Edwin Crow. In Our Town was written by Maddie Kate. The Sandwich is by Jim Stein. And The Rental was written by Christopher Maxim. You can find a link to Christopher Maxim's subreddit in the show notes, as well as a link where you can donate to Christopher, which I encourage you to do in order to show your appreciation for his generosity, allowing me to narrate his stories for free here on Weird Darkness, and simply to support a talented author. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Ephesians 5, verse 15. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. And a final thought. Always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them so much. Oscar Wilde. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey, Weirdos! Our next Weirdo Watch Party is coming up fast! It's Friday, February 9th! The gruesome twosome of Graveyard Cinema, Horrible Henry, and Mad Marty are presenting 1950's Quicksand, starring Mickey Rooney and Peter Lorre. I suppose you'll know what you're getting into. This isn't a car theft. It's kidnapping. In the film, a man takes $20 from his employer to go on a date, planning to replace the money the next day but he falls increasingly into more disastrous circumstances and further in need of more money, and it spirals out of control. Do you ever hear anybody say money talks? Join us Friday, February 9th for Quicksand. It's free to watch online, and you can chat along with the rest of us weirdos as we watch the movie together. How about the girl? You leave her out of it. She had nothing to do with it. you understand me? The show begins at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Mountain, and 5 p.m. Pacific. You can watch a trailer for the film and watch horror hosts and schlocky B-movies anytime, day or night, on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. I want that coat, and I'm going to get it. For $2,000? For whatever it takes. 1950's Quicksand, starring Mickey Rooney and Peter Lorre. You better come and see me or else. Or else what? Or else something is going to happen to you. To you, Danny boy. Friday, February 9th, on the Weirdo Watch Party page. I'll kiss you goodbye if you want me to. Hey, Weirdos! Be sure to click the Like button and subscribe to this channel, and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.